Good morning, everybody. We'd like to call to order the Board of Supervisors for May 22nd, 2018. If we could begin with a roll call, please. Supervisor Leopold. Here. Coonerty. Here. Caput. Here. McPherson. Here. Chair Friend. Here. And before we begin our moment of silence and Pledge of Allegiance, I'd just like to uh, honor Jim Van Houten, who passed away recently. Jim was a very active member of, of LAFCO, as well as in South, the South County, did a lot for Watsonville Wetlands Watch and a number of other environmental organizations who lived on La Selva Beach, but he contributed a lot to this county, and he just recently passed away. So please join us in a moment of silence and the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning, Mr. Palacios. Are there any changes to today's agenda? Uh, there are an, a few uh, changes to the agenda today. Uh, on the consent agenda, item number seven, uh, there's additional materials. There's a revised attachment A, which is packet pages 16 and 17. There's also an addenda to the consent agenda. This is item 53.1, uh, which is to authorize the chair of the board to, to write our state legislative representatives in support of Assembly Bill 2258, which would provide grant funding for special studies to help identify issues and provide recommendations for local agency formation commission to use to promote better services in our county. Uh, this is recommended by Supervisor Leopold. There's a board memo and the bill text for AB 2258. On the regular agenda, item 57, there's additional materials. There's a uh, planning department memo and related correspondence. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Palacios. Good morning, Supervisor Kappa. Is there anything you'd like to pull or briefly comment on on item six through 53.1? No, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Supervisor McPherson. There's a couple of items. Excuse me. There's a couple of items. Uh, item number 14, the report on the Office of Economic Development on the broadband survey. Uh, very encouraging, especially up in the uh, San Lorenzo Valley in the fifth district, that people would be uh, receptive or open to uh, having seen that extend into the valley areas, and I think it would uh, it might help uh, those who want to stay at home and uh, do their work, uh, them who may be employed over in Silicon Valley in particular. But I think it's um, it's a good prospect that uh, something can happen in that that area. Uh, also on number um, 15, the budget adjustments for the county library fund, it's very encouraging. Uh, we have several, because of the people of the county, uh, voted to support um, library measure a couple years ago. We have a great opportunity to expand our services there. And uh, the one in particular in my district, the Felton Library, we hope to break ground this uh, late this summer, or this fall, and it's, uh, it looks very, very good with the library fund uh, funds uh, improved resources that it's getting. Um, on um, the uh, an item number, oh, uh, item number 25 uh, and um, number 27 regarding the probation department, I, it's uh, nice to see the, the plans and specifications have been approved for the juvenile hall multi-use multi recreation and programs facility. Uh, we've had a very good um, uh, grant program there for seeds to table. Uh, that is uh, very encouraging and I'm glad to see that work going on there for those services that would be provided. And on item 27, um, the accept and file the report on AB 109 outcome evaluation by the resource development uh, associates. It shows that Santa Cruz County outcomes in our probation center are better in general than the state average. And uh, I think a lot of credit should go to the probation department for what it does and and all those, uh, the grants that it has received through the recent years, uh, they've really paid off and uh, <coughs> it's doing an excellent job. So I just want to uh, publicly uh, commend them. 
Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Good morning, Supervisor Coonerty. Hi, good morning. Uh, just a couple items uh, to comment on today. Uh, the first is item number 21, which is a report on community TV. And I just also want to point, I'm happy community TV is, seems to be doing well, uh, but also that we've been able to spend the peg fees to support uh, media education in our schools. Um, it's a really great thing uh, to be able to give the next generation that training uh, that'll pay off in both arts and in the future economy. And so so uh, I want to continue uh, supporting those efforts. On item number 24, <clears throat> agreeing to a uh, memorandum of understanding with the Bureau of Land Management around the planning uh, for access and management of the Katoni Costeri's National Monument. Uh, it's been a long time in the making, but one of the requirements of the presidential proclamation was that there be a local uh, land use, uh, local planning process in order to figure out the best uses and access points, and this is the beginning of that phase. Uh, and then similarly to Supervisor McPherson, uh, on item number 25, I'm really happy to see those juvenile hall uh, updates, uh, upgrades coming through to serve uh, those kids. And then on item number 27, I want to thank my colleagues for putting this off. Uh, for a couple of weeks, I met with uh, probation and they answered all my questions and gave me a really good sense of where the funding uh, decisions will be going in the future. <coughs> and I'll, so I appreciate that and I'll be supporting it today. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. Good morning, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, good morning, Chair. Uh, just a couple of items to comment on. On item 16, um, uh, I'm glad to see the uh, General Services Department going out to seek funding uh, for a new electric vehicle, and I just want to take this opportunity to thank the staff in the department uh, for uh, deploying new electric chargers. The charger we have now at Simpkins, uh, I, I see used on a regular basis. And um, I think when we have those, uh, when we deploy those resources, it makes it easier for people to use electric vehicles all around Santa Cruz County. So thank Carol Johnson and General Services for that. On item number 23, uh, this is uh, an item to try to start identifying our affordable housing priorities uh, with all the talk uh, with the state uh, uh, housing bond and talk of a local bond. Uh, it's important for us to have this list together and I appreciate the work done by community members uh, uh, to, to put us in this position, but I think staff will need to spend some time in trying to figure out exactly uh, our greatest priorities and how to use those resources. On item number 25, um, it's a great day that we're finally uh, uh, have plans and going to be going out to bid uh, for Juvenile Hall, the recreation facilities. I, this has been a long uh, time coming. Um, the uh, the June bug or the beetle or whatever it is that has uh, been keeping the, has been challenging as part of this. Um, uh, it's great to see that we were able to resolve the environmental issues so we can get this done. I know that uh, that the staff really cares about ensuring that the kids are healthy while they're there, uh, both in terms of eating and now having good recreational opportunities. So thank you for uh, seeing this through. It's been a long road. Um, I'll also add uh, my appreciation to uh, probation for the AB 109 outcome evaluation. Uh, it is good to see in the presentation that you gave to us the, that the recidivism rate is lower here in Santa Cruz and, uh, than the statewide average. It tells us that, that what we're doing is working and I appreciate all the work uh, and time that the, our probation staff puts into making that happen. Um, on item number 38, uh, I, I encourage everyone to really read this report about the Bringing Families Home program. This, this is a, a, a great grant that we got to help families. And in reading that report and reading the stories that are in this report, um, it really, um, uh, hit me pretty hard about the challenges that families face and uh, the, the role that housing plays in keeping families together. And I just really appreciate the ongoing work of our staff to, uh, to find these resources to help these families to strengthen families here in Santa Cruz. So thank you very much for that. On item number 41, I want to thank the park staff um, uh, for working with neighbors in the Moran uh, Lake area uh, there's an opportunity for us to acquire this land to be able to, to, to make it a more active recreation area. And uh, I appreciate the leadership of our park staff in, in, in putting this together. And uh, I look forward to continuing working with them to make sure that we have these pathways and other pieces uh, that will make this an even uh, greater used um, uh, local resource. 
On item number 46, uh, is, I'm glad to see Public Works moving forward with the plans and specification for the Main Street, Bridge Street project. I know this is a long time coming, and I know the staff has been working very hard to, to make this project happen. Uh, this will be a great addition to Soquel, and will really improve the safety for uh, the kids going uh, to Main Street School. So thank you very much for the hard work you put into that. And lastly, I would urge the support of my colleagues on item 53.1 uh, in support of AB uh, 2258. Uh, this is an opportunity for the first time for the state to provide uh, funding to LAFCOs to do special studies. And as, um, as my colleagues who serve on LAFCO know, right now we're in the midst of a very expensive study, but an important study to looking at the mergers uh, or consolidation possibility of uh, fire districts. Um, these are the kind of uh, studies that need to be done, but uh, LAFCOs and the way that they're funded, it makes it hard to have those resources. So uh, this bill would be the first time that the state would be providing money uh, to do these special studies, and it could help improve the efficiency of local government. So I urge your support. Thank you, Supervisor Lee Pilled. And I'll open it up uh, for the community. We are commenting here on consent. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address us on items 6 through 53.1. Would anybody like to come forward on consent? Morning. Good morning, Becky Steinberger. Um, I would like to comment on item. Uh, 42, and I realize this is just setting the dates for the study sessions for the Public Works um, Capital Improvement Program. I just want to uh, be very public in my protest for the over $6 million that's being spent in public money in the Aptos Village area to accommodate the Aptos Village project's additional 8,000 cars a day that has been estimated by now retired county senior traffic engineer, Mr. Jack Sreikoff. I think that's an abuse of public funds, a gift of public funds to the developer, and I protest it in advance of these study sessions. I would also like to pull items number 44 and 49 and respectfully ask, because I'm taking time off my job this morning to be here, that um, you uh, consider these two items um, at the end of the consent agenda action, rather than making me wait until the very end of the day. Are there any other items you want to con comment on on consent? No, that's all. We'll make them items, we'll take item 55 first, we'll make them items 55.1 and 55.2. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, uh, in re regard not to that subject in, in particular, but to this capital improvement report, this is the best, most sync, understandable capital improvement report we've had in some time. It's really well done. I want to just compliment uh, the Public Works Department and the CAO for putting together a very understandable proposed 2018-19 uh, capital improvement report. Thank you. Anybody else like to address us on consent? Good morning. Uh, morning. My name is Victorious Alexander, and I apologize, I don't have my glasses. I hate not having my glasses, but I rushed, and so I didn't have my glasses, but I want to be able to talk on, uh, on the consent calendar uh, light item 15. It's very important to myself and then also to my constituents. Uh, they need, we need more funding for the, uh, for the public libraries. Uh, you know, and I really enjoy the Scotts Valley Library, even though I got thrown out twice for uh, reading my books, right? Um, how to win an election and then uh, democracy and chains. This was in the past, but, uh, and also I got thrown out of Watsonville Library, public library, for speaking up for the people that are being, uh, they're turning the public library in Watsonville into a checkpoint, even though it's a city library into a checkpoint for the Mexicans. Um, but, but when it comes to the funding, I think that the increase uh, is important. We need to ex extend the uh, library hours to seven days a week because a lot of the constituents that I notice are depending on the internet connection. They're depending on the library to be able to go and read uh, because they have a lot of uh, leisure, li uh, 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 um, leisure time. And so I, I see a great need. And extending the libraries will help people feel uh, a lot better. I know that in your district, uh, Bruce McPherson, I know that the Felton Library is open on Sunday. The hours are limited, but I think it's important. A lot of people can't migrate all the way down there into the, um, into the uh, 
uh, Felton uh, Library. But increasing it is a good thing. It keeps people uh, not caught up in shenanigans. They're on the, the computers uh, reading. I think the funding is very important. Also, um, in extending the hours, also the uh, light item uh, number on uh, uh, the justice and public safety regarding uh, the probation department uh, want to destroy the uh, the routine videos, you know. I, I you know just destroying videos, you know. I don't know if it, uh, the probation department got body cams, but I, I would want to preserve those to help members of the public uh, for whatever issues they need. Also, line item number uh, 27, the AB 109. Um, I I according to this right here, the report they had no public input. No community involvement, you know, and I, I just say that, that it's just one-sided. It's a privileged point of view when we just allow the functionary bureaucrats to keep trying to impose what they want. It's only going to get better, man, when you include members of the public to weigh in and to help shape the policies. I would say, hey, stop funding these people, man. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else like to address us on consent? I see none. We'll bring it back to the board for action. I move the consent agenda. Second. So there's a motion and a second on the consent agenda with two items that have been pulled. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Now we'll do oral communications, an opportunity for members of the community to address us on items that are not on today's agenda but are within the purview of the Board of Supervisors. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. I have some goodies to pass out. Good morning, Chair and Supervisors and staff. My name is Michelle Williams. I'm Executive Director of Arts Council Santa Cruz County. And I'm here today to invite you to Ebb and Flow. Ebb and Flow is a two-day, all-ages, family-friendly, free festival of art, science, and our river. And uh, an event as extraordinary and diverse as this is only possible in a creative community such as ours. So thank you for your leadership and your vision that has made this possible. Ebb and Flow kicks off on Friday night. We're closing down Cooper Street for a full night of art making, puppetry, music, and dance. When the sun sets, we're all going to process together on the river walk at night to Front Street. We're closing down Front Street for a street party fire dancing DJ, and we're going to be unveiling the installation of a semi-permanent public art piece on the SoCal Street Bridge by local artists Rachel Stahl and Aaron Altmark. And this public art piece is one of a kind. It is an LED, LED lit installation that the lights respond to the data that's happening in the river. You're not going to want to miss it. At noon on June 2nd, we're having a march for the river. Right now being passed out are school, uh, fish projects that we've passed out to local schools so they can create schools of fish to join us on the march for the river. And then we end at the Tannery Arts Center for an all-day celebration. Art making, music, dance, giant bubbles, river education, and we're also bringing Bandaloop, the vertical performance pioneers who will be dancing off the lofts at the Tannery Arts Center. Right. It's a full day, amazing celebration celebration of art and science, a marriage and collaboration between nearly a dozen public and private agencies. We invite you to come, bring your families, and I want to say thank you to all of you for your visionary leadership of the, uh, 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 and support of the arts, because these things aren't possible unless we live in a community as extraordinary as ours. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ms. You. Williams. Thank you for your work. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, Supervisors and Chair Friend. My name is Greg Pepping. I'm the Executive Director of the Coastal Watershed Council. Probably not surprised that I'm following Michelle's um, comments about the river. Um, the Coastal Watershed Council is an environmental nonprofit. We've been around since 1995 and we've partnered with the county in all those years. Historically, we have focused on all the rivers and creeks that drain to Monterey Bay. In recent years, we've focused as many of our resources as we can on the San Lorenzo River. And we've learned a lot in those years. We've learned that the river is an integral part of the history of this community. And, and, and it's a missed opportunity right now. It lacks the vibrancy that some communities have. Ebb and Flow, the Ebb and Flow River Festival is one of many opportunities that the community is investing in to reconnect to the river, to transform our relationship to the river. So we partner with fisheries biologists at the county um, and the city and other nonprofits, stormwater professionals. We're the, your green schools program implementer. We work with stormwater, um, stormwater experts in public works, environmental health, sometimes parks. And we're collectively, all of us, we're okay at getting messages across about habitat and water quality and the importance of rivers. When you bring artists into the, to the picture, when you bring the artist community, and it's not just an artist community, it's this artist community, it's a total game changer. 
it's an entirely different opportunity to, because the science stuff that we do speaks to a lot of people, but when you get the artists involved and the creativity that they bring, it's a unique opportunity to get people to realize the importance of this river and its history. That this river is the largest watershed in this county, that the river is about 30 miles long and it runs right by this building, right by this county seat, uh, the, the economic center of Santa Cruz. The river is home to endangered and threatened species. The river is drinking water supply for about 100,000 people in this county, 100,000. Over a third of the people in this county use that as their primary drinking water supply. It's, an, it's a driver for economic activity and could be more of one. And it is a special place, perhaps most importantly, amongst all those uh, benefits that the river offers us. It's an opportunity for everyone in this community to get away from these things and our dizzying fast-paced life and go down to the river and it's waiting for us, peaceful and calm, and restore through connecting with nature. And I bring that up particularly because uh, it's important for the entire community. It's important for a lot of people in this building that you lead. So I bring that up um, because the Ebb and Flow River, the Ebb and Flow River Festival is an opportunity to highlight all that. We welcome you. I uh, have a unique request. If you put on your hats, uh, you have more hair than I do to worry about messing up. But if you put on your hats, Michelle would love a photo. Um, if you decline that, I understand. But we invite you to come out and rediscover the river. We protect what we know and love. Ebb and Flow River Festival is an opportunity to learn about the river and to love it. So we welcome you to come out June 1st and June 2nd. I've got a couple takers on the hats. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pepping. We'll do it. All right. <laughs> you probably Morning. used to get together. Uh, hold on. I think we got to get over here, Greg. All right. <laughs> I didn't really think you'd say yes. <laughs> Is that everybody's good side? Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. <laughs> good morning, welcome, thanks for waiting. And thank you for your visionary leadership. It really makes, this festival is a great thing, but the work that you two do every day in your respective organizations really make a difference in the community. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board. I'm Jeffrey Ellis. Uh, here to comment on the use, uh, possible use of the uh, park and ride on uh, Soquel Avenue near the hospital um, as a homeless shelter. Um, I've heard about uh, discussions from Santa Cruz City Council that they think they can do that. I don't know if they can do that or not, but. Uh, what, what should happen is that it should be your decision uh, as the board on land use in unincorporated Santa Cruz County. Uh, I, I sent uh, emails to each of you questioning whether or not this could happen without an opportunity for public input. Uh, I certainly hope not and I uh, appreciate the responses that I got from, from you or you know personally or, or staff. Um, please do not let this happen uh, as a decision in, in the middle of the night. Uh, it needs to be a decision of this board uh, following a proper opportunity for public input. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Michael Spadafore. I own Java Junction down at Twin Lakes uh, Beach. I came down here and talked to you guys last March. Was it last March? Yeah, last March. I talked to you guys about the progress, nothing being done down on the beach. So I got calls from the, I got counties from Public Works, I got calls from my supervisor's office saying that they were working on the plans. Didn't have plans on the ocean side of the road. So come Memorial Day weekend last year, the road was still closed, both sides of the road. There was no parking, nothing else. Nothing had been done from March until Memorial Day. So I tried to put off as long as I could since me and the rest of the business owners are under a lot of pressure of customers not coming down there, I tried to put off construction starting again till after the summertime. I was told as soon as the plans were done, they would start. They didn't have the plans done until late August. So we had a meeting, a round table meeting with the um, port commissioner, with, with the port, the business owners, Granite and the Department of Public Works told us that they had everything ready to go and it would be done, it would start September 15th and be done April 26th. So now, Come this year, 
I'm all like, why aren't you guys doing anything? You had the plans, you knew what you were doing. Find out after calling everybody that they didn't know what they put into the cement. So they had to have the cement mix tested, which held us back again. So now I just get the new blog saying, the road's not gonna be open until July 3rd, two-way traffic. The road was closed November 20th to one, it, it reduced down to one-way traffic. So today, there's three people working down there. Yesterday, there were four people working down there. There's a million people that come down to that beach a year. My sales are down, the Palomar sales are down, the Crow's Nest sales are down. They need to close the road, move the traffic on the other side so that they can finish the north side of the road. The north side of the road was closed all last summer. The only reason that there was parking last summer was because Memorial, Thursday before Memorial Day, I took it upon myself to move all the cones on the north side back as far as it could to make it wider for cars to get through on both directions and people to safely walk. I'm the one that piled up all the sawhorses that kept the ocean side of the road closed. Come Monday after Memorial Day, they put them all up. I'm the one that had to call Department of Public Works and tell them to clean up all their construction supplies that were piled up at the roundabout. Before you guys talk about doing any more projects or the public works, you guys need to look at, I've been told that, uh, you need to look at your policy procedures. I've been told, well, we can't tell our contractors what to do. We can't do this, we can't do that. Nobody's working down there. I mean, it's, it's a joke. That's all I have to say. I mean, there's, there's landscaping that has to be done still. There's homeowners, there's, there's rentals that can't rent out their houses because their beach is closed. And you finish that wall and it's like stucco or coral. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning, Judy Grunstra. Um, I'd like to suggest that a Measure S Oversight Committee be formed and recruited um, for the library. The previous Measure S now is going to be another Measure S in the city, which is a little confusing. Um, there's a Measure a Citizen Oversight Committee uh, for transportation money. Uh, measure D, then there are citizen oversight uh, for Measure A and B, the school funding, and uh, Measure S needs an oversight committee as well. Uh, I know the money's already been designated to the jurisdictions, but um, within those jurisdictions there are projects being suggested or moving forward that um, may or may not be um, within the Measure S wording that people voted for. So I'd like to move this ahead sooner rather than later. Um, most people don't pay attention to, I think, who's running things there in the library, the JPA, I know Mr. Palacios is on the JPA, but uh, I think there's a potential for conflict of interest when the members of the JPA are also the city managers, so, um, you know, they have a, they are not really held accountable in the same way as elected officials are. So uh, I'd like to suggest that a Measure S Oversight Committee be formed. Thank you. Thank it's you. Millions of dollars. You know. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Becky Steinbrenner. I concur with Ms. Gun Gunstra. Uh, a Measure S Oversight Committee is needed. I have protested many times the expenditure of millions of dollars from Measure S for the Live Oak Library Annex, which is really a community center. And I would also like to comment on the ebb and flow event. I think it's great. I'd really love to see some action on the Pajaro River, too, and applaud the uh, Watsonville City Council's recent bike rides on the levee. They're great. I would like to uh, comment, um, because I'm not going to be able to stay, have to get back to work, on the this afternoon's Nissan development um, hearing. I am really Ms. opposed. Ms. Steinbrenner, we, we can't do that comment during oral communications. Uh, we did receive your, your letter on it, though, uh, two weeks ago, whatever it was. All right, but thank you. I just want to uh, remind uh, Supervisor Leopold, he said there would be no light at, at uh, Robertson at a public meeting. Then I'll move on to my other comment that I hope will be allowed, and that is regarding um, no encroachment permit in the Aptos Village project area. I have submitted twice Public Records Act requests of County Council 
and both times I have been told there is no encroachment permit for the work that the Aptos Village project developers are doing and have done within the county public right of way. I have um, a copy of the county public works fees and under their own schedule, this permit is required and if it is not there and work proceeds, there is, an, there is to be an investigation. I've turned this matter into uh, code compliance. I've written public works many times and I've made it publicly known that there is no encroachment permit. What that does for the county is it makes the county and the taxpayers liable for any injuries or property damage as a result of the work that's, that the contractor has done. And there is a lot being done on Cathedral Drive, on Trout Gulch, on SoCal now, there's steel plates in the bicycle path without any cones or anything. Why is there no encroachment permit being required for the Aptos Village project developers? It's a lot of money that the county should be getting. It's a release of liability that the county needs to get and the taxpayers need to get. I guess that's all I'm allowed to say right now. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Ms. Garrett. Indeed, why is there no encroachment permit uh, for that Aptos project? And why is our taxpayer money going for so-called development, which I call desecration and despoilment of the area. I'm gonna read something that some of you may have read recently uh, in a certain publication. The FCC forced rollout of the new 5G wireless technology and Internet of Things will force a cell tower transmitter in front of every 2 to 12 homes emitting high density, high frequency wireless microwave radio frequency radiation, 24 gigahertz to 900 gigahertz, 90 gigahertz. Wireless radiation has been proven, and you know this to be so, proven to be harmful and will increase cancer, neurological disease, immune system disorders, and damage fertility near these 5G transmitters. Google 5G science appeal is the source. Science studies have shown for decades that radio frequency radiation has subthermal biological effects below our current FCC guidelines. Google Naval Medical Research Institute of 1972. The 1996 Telecommunications Act, Section 704, has been used to ban uh, local governments from uh, even considering your health and safety when placing these antennas. Why would they um, ban looking at health effects if there were no health effects? We are allowing the industry control, the FCC, to microwave uh, poison our families, children, homes, neighborhoods, and it gives the sources here. Um, this is, um, and he says, there is a new two-party system, representatives who represent uh, corporate interests and those that represent the public interests. He represents the public interests. This is Kevin Modis running for uh, U.S. Senate. That's what we need you to do, is represent the public interests. Four more of these 4G sites, the platform for 5G technology, were approved in this very room by your zoning administrator last Friday. One of them near the new library on Live Oak in the parking lot so that people can get more dangerous radiation and the children can be radiated. The other by the case the association represent the public well-being, not the corporate harm. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back, Mr. Alexander. Good morning. Uh, this is Victorious Alexander, civil society activist. Uh, Marilyn, I just want to be able to say your outfit looked really adorable. Really like our outfit. Um, 
but I want to be able to share with members of the public real quick before I pivot it, uh, before I pivot into my public comment what it is to be a good flying waving American and I know my last appearance I was not at my best getting down here is a real struggle dealing with the PTSD dealing with my soul struggles I really don't like advocating for myself that's what thrusts me in here trying to find community justice all right I wear my glasses because I don't want I don't want to look like none of you guys I really don't I don't want to be a part of the establishment I'm not courting public admiration nor am I looking for a handout that should tell you guys something members of the public you know because they're watching me you know they're watching me because they want to hear the uh, the uh, the unscripted reality the soul struggle right I come in here because uh, hey I'm being abused by the whole system you know and if we can't speak liberating truth to political power what hope do we have for a better tomorrow I want to remind members of the public because I don't believe in the left and right paradigm I don't even believe in voting there goes my flag but you know I still want to give hope because there are good men and women that do uh, run the system the elections coming up June 5th local elections and I want to be able to weigh on the political issues I want to share people with my social relationship with, with some of the county board of supervisors I want to let the Mexican and people of color to know that uh, a supervisor uh, a great capital is a great man I, I want you guys to vote him back into office he's a great man a lot of the activists here really enjoy him he's for the people right I know uh, the, there's a lot of people out there that, that are contending for your seat I want to remind people that there's a provisional ballot if you're registered within the Santa Cruz County and you can't make it down to the voting you can run in there real quick and do the provisional just ask them provisional they're not gonna ask no questions no 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 ID and you're gonna be able to vote but I'm here because I'm looking for community justice right we got the DA's office right and we got the legal community just corrupting our common life you know when I'm being mistreated and when they're trying to take me through two malicious prosecution trying to consolidate the case right the DA they have no case in Scotts Valley so they want to consolidate here's Sergeant Fish uh, Fish and then we got Sergeant Spark back here right here's her here's her body cam right they're showing her body cam and prosecutorial misconduct is three year three years in state prison so this is what I'm gonna be asking now in this corporatory evidence here's Sergeant Fish he has a body cam the DA's office and the Sheriff Department don't want to turn over that evidence and it, I find it ironic that they had a shooting in which they shot the suspect three times coming from Santa Clara and now they want to make let members of the public release the video why can't they do that for civil society activists that are good law-abiding citizens why can't they thank, do that for me thank you Mr. Alexander thank you is there anybody else I'd like to address us in oral communications seeing none we'll close oral communications we'll go on to the first item of the regular agenda which is item 55 which is to consider the 2018 2019 tax and revenue anticipation notes not to exceed a total of 45 million dollars authorize the auditor to secure the note adopt resolution authorizing the sale of the 2018 19 tax and revenue anticipation notes approve the execution of a continuing disclosure certificate approve the form of the official statement and official notice of sale approve the distribution of a preliminary official statement and authorize necessary actions and execution of documents in connection with the issuance of the 1819 tax and revenue anticipation notes as outlined and the memo of the auditor controller treasurer tax collector we had the board member of the resolution and the trans information and that's the shortest title I'd just like to appreciate <laughs> the auditor controller treasurer tax collector for this item are you going to kick it off I am Ms. Driscoll okay good morning good morning Edith Driscoll auditor controller treasurer tax collector the item before you is the county's annual tax and revenue anticipation notes or TRAN in an amount not to exceed a total of 45 million dollars with your approval to go forward, the notes are scheduled to be sold on June 13, 2018, and will mature in less than a year. These short-term notes are issued by the county to address timing issues or lag time between cash disbursements, which occur evenly throughout the year, we pay our bills regularly, and revenue receipts such as property taxes and state and federal reimbursements, which are received less regularly, and later in the year, creating a cash flow problem for the county. Without the issuance of these notes, the county would experience its most negative cash balance day in late October before the first property tax bills are due in November. These notes provide cash flow during otherwise negative periods. The county has issued annual tax and revenue anticipation notes, TRAN, for many years. 
This year, we are recommending issuing 45 million in notes. Last year, the county issued 47.5 million, and for many years prior to that, we issued 50 million. The county's cash position has improved over the recent years, in part due to the county's increased cash reserves, resulting in less borrowing being needed. Fiscal and economic presentations were recently made to both Moody's and Standard & Poor's rating agencies by the county finance team, which includes staff from the Auditor Controller's Office, the CAO's Office, along with Suzanne Harrell, the county's financial advisor. The rating agencies should be issuing their rating shortly, and we anticipate that they will be SP1 plus and MIG negative one, as we received last year. These represent the highest short-term ratings available. Working with our financial advisor, the county has prepared the preliminary official statement and other required documents necessary for this sale. These documents are included in today's board item for your approval. The interest rate will be fixed upon the sale and payable at maturity. This will be a competitive sale uh, document. I ask that your board approve the recommended actions authorizing the Auditor Controller to proceed with the necessary actions to issue the 2018-19 TRAN in an amount not to exceed $45 million. And that your board adopt the attached resolution authorizing the sale, approve the execution of a continuing disclosure certificate, approve the form of the official statement and official notice of sale, approve the distribution of the preliminary official statement, and authorize necessary actions and execution of documents in connection with the issuance of the 2018-19 TRAN. Thank you for cons your consideration of this item. I'm available if you have any questions. Thank you, Ms. Driscoll. Are there any questions from board members before we open it up to the community? Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the short presentation, Ms. Driscoll, and thank you for the work of the staff. Um, you know, the, the work that the board has done uh, to uh, manage the budget uh, has really in, uh, helped Im improve our rating. Uh, this is a very necessary uh, 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 a borrowing that we have to do, uh, but to see that we have the high, that we expect the highest ratings possible um, means that those who assess uh, our fiscal health r recognize that we're doing the best job we can w uh, with the money we have. Correct. And I just uh, want to acknowledge the work that your staff does every day and help to make that happen. It really makes a difference. Thank so. you. We appreciate that. Thank you. Any other comments from board members? Okay. We'll open it up for the community. As a member, there's an opportunity for members of the community to address us on item 55. <coughs> Bless you. Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. Thank you for that report, too. And um, I have a question. Is this being done because um, there is a gap? I remember in last year's, uh, it started off three years ago, we were like 12.8 million short. And that ma amount has been reduced to, I think, 8 million um, at last year's. Is that why we're having to, to borrow? So go ahead and ask your question. Okay, we'll why are we having to borrow? Can you okay. please answer that for the public? Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments from members of the community on this item? Shall I go ahead? No. Nope. I mean, I felt like you actually answered this question in your presentation, but if you want to restate it, that's fine. Sure. Um, think about it in simple terms of money in, money out. We don't get our money in as early as we need to send money out. So it's simply a matter of that we need to pay our bills before property taxes come in. Okay. Ms. Garrett? Thank you for that layperson's explanation. <laughs> I must say it's um, very technical and over my head, but I do. Um, and I also think we need to have evening meetings. When you have public hearings, as with the zoning administrator, and people are at work at 9 a.m., it's, it's a mockery. So this kind of item needs to be on an evening agenda. And I appreciate your, you know, financial skills and laying this out. I should, certainly don't have them, but I, 
um, and dismayed often to see the misappropriation of funds, like for big developments, taxpayer money going. And then I brought this up before, where you look at the overall picture of where all our tax dollars are going, and I'm a homeowner, I pay plenty of taxes for the county, to the county. Um, over half of our dollars go to the military budget for wars present and past, and when over 50 percent is siphoned out, we don't have what we need to provide for the benefits of the community and the quality of life. We need to uh, shift that kind of priority, and I know you're members of, what is it, county governments or different associations that represent county board of supervisors, mayors, this needs to be looked at seriously of the priority of where the finances are going, that we need to keep this money in the community so we can provide for the well-being of the community. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else like to address this? This should be specifically on the issuance of these notes. Sorry, I forgot my uh, my prop. But I, I just want to tell you thank you for that report. It was really, uh, really uplifting. Uh, also, I just want to be able to, to support uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, um, um, I, my, my, yeah, Marilyn, uh, a request of, uh, you know, when you do the budget hearings, maybe do it at night so members of the public can, can come and weigh in, the hardworking Americans that do pay for all this. So, so Mr. Alexander, let's, let's actually keep it to the item. Okay. I, I just there wanna, are two I, budget hearing yeah. input sessions at night, one in Watsonville, one in Santa Cruz, have done it for decades. So okay. let's just keep to this item, though. Okay. Uh, so my, my, I do appreciate that. It my, is, have it right here in the County Board of Supervisors. Yeah, Thank there you. Is, Thank there you. is one. Okay. You just haven't attended them. Oh, sorry. Okay. So is there anybody else that would like to address us on item 55? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board for action. I move the uh, recommended action and just want to say, uh, repeat uh, Supervisor Leopold's comments. Uh, congratulations to um, the whole county team for putting us in a much better position. Uh, four or five years ago, we weren't in this position, but uh, it's, it, it's, uh, it's going to be better for the people of, uh, of this county and um, uh, the lower interest rates that we have to pay and so forth. That it, uh, It's worth the effort and I want to just thank everybody who's been involved, especially well, I'll start with the auditor, and you can have all the rest of the, those departments uh, that you oversee, but thank you very much. We have a motion? Second. So we have a motion from Supervisor uh, McPherson, a second from Supervisor Leopold. Uh, any additional comments? Uh, I'll just say uh, uh, just one last thing. You know, the board has made a, a number of, uh, uh, of uh, fiscal decisions during the years of the Great Recession and thereafter, uh, where we've worked hard to manage cost, where we've uh, worked to increase uh, the, our reserves. Uh, that has yielded a better rating. Uh, it allows us to do, which is, this is a normal course of business, for us to spend less money doing that normal course of business. And so it's a reflection of our, our, our board, our CAO, all of our departments, and our auditor controller. Thanks for doing the work. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. We'll now move on to item 40, pulled item 44, which is 55.1, which is approved a contract change order in the amount of $394,331.78 for the Aptos Village Improvements Phase 1 project and take related actions as recommended by the Interim Director of Public Works. We have a board member of the contract uh, change owner and uh, Ms. Steinbrenner. You pulled this item? Thank you. And uh, again, thank you for taking this item now instead of at the end of the day. <laughs> My employer really appreciates it too. Um, I am here because I want to protest this. Um, I am happy that the contaminated railroad bed soils were responsibly handled. Uh, they were very toxic and had to be hauled to a, a, a place over the hill that takes very toxic soils. But I want to protest that um, part of this uh, $21,495 of it is going to pay John Madonna Construction Company for training their workers in hazardous materials. That's unnecessary because they are certified to handle hazardous materials. Their website states it, and I called their office. They've been certified to handle hazardous materials for 10 years. So why are the county taxpayers having to pay them almost 
$22,000 to train their workers in something that they are already trained and certified to do. I think this is a misuse of public money, and I protested and asked that you do not uh, approve that amount. I also uh, protest that they, uh, the county taxpayers are paying them f over $3,000 because they had to relocate their staging area. They were always staged over in the Aptos Village project. They were always there. They didn't move anything, except maybe they had to move their soils that they had taken over there before county environmental health got into the picture and deemed them contaminated. Maybe they had to do something there, but that was not the fault of the taxpayers, and they should not, we should not be held accountable for paying for it. This project, the phase one Aptos Village traffic improvements, has cost taxpayers almost $2 million. This county, this project alone is um, $1.8 million. And very little of it, if any, coming from the Aptos Village project developers. This project involved moving the bus stop for the developers to have parking and their gateway entrance to the development. That's all. And that was publicly stated by Metro officials. It was done to provide parking for the Cafe Sparrow people and to provide space for the gateway entry to what is proposed to be the Parade Street entrance from Soquel Drive for the Aptos Village project. So I am protesting, uh, certainly, and ask you the, the $21,500 for training John Madonna Construction in hazardous materials, that's unnecessary, and I should, I do not think we should pay it, nor do I think we should pay for them to thank, relocate thank you, their Ms. staging. Senator. Does everybody else like to address us on the change order? I want to um, second everything Becky said. I'm a 30, let's see, um, 37 year resident of Aptos, and I think, I think one of you, or all of you, should take these well-researched comments of Becky Steinbrunner and put it into action. Misappropriating public funds to suit the profits of a developer is not what public officials should be doing. It's inappropriate, it's irresponsible, and we're up to several million dollars here of taxpayer money for this. I take the bus, and I went right by there today on the 71 bus, speaking to the bus driver, and he said there have been stops that have been made uh, where they built stops that they don't use that haven't been implemented, but it's inappropriate for taxpayers to be paying to suit this development, and it happens over and over again. I'm beginning to think that the taxpayer money that we get towards develop for, from developers Maybe that's a false paradigm. I remember reading an article, Hidden Costs of Development, that we are giving our money for the infrastructure of these. And the bus driver, the traffic is just horrible. It was horrible before, it's getting worse, and it will get worse. And I was late here today because, because of the traffic. Um, so I think I protest this. I don't think this, these funds should go for this. And um, it, it's really, what are you doing here? How are you representing the public? I, you know, past boards of supervisors would listen to the public and actually take some of the recommendations because they were so well researched. Here, it's like, we haven't even spoken, and Becky Steinbrunner is one of the most thorough researchers, analysts of where our money is going. She speaks in the public interest. I want you to do that, not in the interest of Barry Swenson and the developers. Thank you.
Thank you, Ms. Garrett. This is about the change order. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I got it. You don't keep it to that actual subject. I, I got it. I got it. Uh, I just want to be able to say this, uh, line 44, thanks to Becky Steinbrenner's leadership, I want to be able to say this, very illuminating, and the Bundago expenditures are not needed. And remember, this is a reflection of the County Board of Supervisors, man. The American public don't want all this, uh, the political scamming. Honest day work for honest day pay, man. I worked all my life. We don't want to be supporting scams. So I would say, hey, at some point in our humanity, we got to come at it right. It works for all of us. You know, well, Becky Steinbrenner is pointing out the political details, dude, it, it grieves. I'm not coming down here struggling to come down here and just not participate. I'm going to weigh in. We're going to have to make political, we're going to have to make social accommodations. The threat from down below is real, man. I'm telling you. Okay. Is there anybody else who would like to address us on the change order? Uh, seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board for action. I move the recommended actions. Second. A motion from Supervisor Leopold, a second from Supervisor Coonerty. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Move on to item 55.2, which is pulled item 49. Ms. Steinbrenner, this is the item adopt resolution in, uh, accepting and appropriating unanticipated revenue in the amount of $329,000 from the Highway Safety Improvement Program funds for the South County Striping Project. Accept the low bid of Chris Company of Fremont in the amount of 250-60210, authorizing award of the contract and take uh, related actions. We have the memo, the resolution, the bidders list and actually your uh, original comments that are attached to this item as well. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. Um, again, I want to protest uh, the inclusion of portions of the Trout Gulch Road uh, sections that have been destroyed by Barry Swenson Builder in their Aptos Village project work. As they have uh, cut into the road in multiple places, they've uh, damaged the road on Trout Gulch where the county is now going to use public money, federal money, to repair and with a striping grant. And I've protested this before. I've asked you to adjust the boundaries of this. It's a, it's a small area. It is, I agree. But it's the principle. And if part of this federal grant is used to repair work that a private developer has done and has done without an encroachment permit from County Public Works again, I think that you need to look at a gift of public funds and abuse of public funds and what that might mean for the county, for its reputation and for future funding. According to the Public Works document, the developer should be getting an encroachment permit and paying $10.72 a linear foot for work that they're doing, and that would include the striping repair work. But Public Works wants to do this work for Barry Swenson Builder because, as Mr. Wiesner has said, and I'm not misquoting you, <laughs> I've been accused of that, um, the county wants the work done properly. So what does that say about the county's confidence in these developers to repair the work that they have, uh, the roads that they have damaged? And all the more reason for these developers to be required to get an encroachment permit. So again, I'm going to ask you to not, uh, to, to amend the boundaries of this striping project, to eliminate the portions of Trout Gulch Road that Barry Swenson Builder has destroyed and should be responsible for repairing properly. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else would like to address us on this contract? I want to urge you to take action on the recommendations of Becky Steinbrunner on the inappropriate use of our public funds to repair what this developer has damaged. That should be his financial responsibility. You know, this reflects upon you. And the public doesn't have, in large part, much sense that you are helping the public when they see this type of uh, siphoning off of public funds for a developer's profit that we're paying for. And you are sitting there like, oh well, that's all right. What, it's no wonder 
that people are distrustful of government that's supposed to represent them. Responsible supervisors, and I remember Marty Wormhout and Jan Buths when they were on this board, would look more carefully at things, stop projects, re-examine. This is really disturbing. I would like to be represented as other members of the public. Why are you giving our money to Barry Sampson, developer, and Joe Appenrod for damage they've caused? And this is just part of the damage. I feel we hear this Aptos Village project, I call it an Aptos Pillage project. The trees are gone, toxic spills, it looks like Silicon Valley South. The traffic is huge. There's only two ways to get in there. They used to be called Dos Pasos Malos, two bad passes or roads. M Ms. Garrett, the striping project. Uh, the striping project should not be approved. Okay. That's all. Our money should not go for that, okay. thank you. Because this item is not about the Aptos Village project, irrespective of what all the commenters are speaking of. This is a contract award for a South County striping project. So Mr. Alexander, if you'd like to speak to this uh, proposal to accept the low bid for a South County striping project. Yeah, yeah, I, I just want to be able to comment on uh, Becky Steinbrenner's leadership, that members of the public, uh, I just want to say members of the public need to pay heed. She illuminates members of the public and she's speaking liberating truth to political power. People don't want these to be supporting scams. So I would say, hey, don't fund it. Thank you. All right, is there anybody else that would like to address us on move. the item? Seeing none, move back to the board. Move approval. Second. We have a motion for the recommended actions from Supervisor Coonerty, a second from Supervisor Leopold. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Because we actually have a long closed session, the board will just take a break right now until a 1030 scheduled item, then we'll come back for the 1030 scheduled item. After the 1030 scheduled item, we'll go into closed session. We'll make sure there's an opportunity for members of the community to address us at that time. So the board will recess for 30 minutes until 1030. Take my hat back. Everybody, I'd like to welcome everybody back to the Board of Supervisors meeting. We have a very special 1030 scheduled item, which is the presentation recognizing the Emergency Medical Services Week, as outlined as a chair from our office. And we'd like to uh, kick it off by inviting the Health Services, Services Agency Director Nguyen up to make some introductory comments. Good morning. Welcome, Director Nguyen. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman and members of the Board. Jane Nguyen from the Health Services Agency. It's my honor to um, be here before you today to celebrate the National Emergency Medical Services Week. And for our county, as you know, Emergency Medical Services Week is a nationally recognized opportunity for all of us to express our thanks for the rather clock heroism of our EMS providers and our local resident bystanders who stepped in to save the lives of those in need. Um, just wanted to share with you some very cool stat. Um, you, I thought you would uh, like to hear this. Um, last year, we treated about 155 people with cardiac arrest conditions. Nationwide, survival from this devastating disease was only 36%. However, in our county, our survival rate is almost 48%, which means that in our county, you or your loved one is 33% more likely to walk out of the hospital than you are elsewhere in the state or our country. This success is due to the hard work and professionalism of our dis dispatchers, our firefighters, our paramedics, our EMTs, nurses, and doctors. But there is another ingredient to the success. In over half of our cases, CPR was immediately started by, by a family member, coworker, or average citizen out in the community, 13% greater than the rest of the country. This is important because we know that early CPR is one of the most important predictor, predictors for survival. 
Each year, free, free of charge, our current ambulance provider, American Medical Response, trains thousands of ordinary people in hands-on, in hands-only CPR. Today, on the first floor in our building, they are offering this training to anyone who so desires. If anyone ha has a loved one who one day may suffer from cardiac arrest, I urge you to participate today. So with that, I wanted to um, thank uh, your board for uh, taking the time to acknowledge our local heroes and um, also want to thank our staff from the Health Services Agency, Dr. David Giladucci, who's our medical director for EMS, and our um, EMS administrator, Brenda Brenner, and all of the staff, and all of the members from EMCC Commission who who you appointed to that help us guide us through the years to help us with our emergency medical services system here in Santa Cruz County. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Brenda Branner, who will lead um, our presentation this morning. Thank you. Good morning, Ms. Brenner. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you for having us. This is the 12th year that the board has recognized EMS week in our county, and we would really like to thank you for your continued support of this. This is very important to the responders. Historically, we honor only EMS personnel as heroes of emergency incidents um, that would take place during the year. This year, we're also honoring agencies of the EMS mutual aid system. This is the system that shares EMS personnel with other counties during statewide disasters. This year we're going to highlight two emergency incidents. One was out of our county. It was the North Bay fires up in the Napa and Sonoma area. Uh, and the second one was a fire that took place inside our county and the response to that. <coughs> I am one of the county's local Mohawk, M-H-O-A-C. And what that stands for is Medical Health Operational Area Coordinator. A Mohawk is the county's 24-7, 365 single point of contact to coordinate EMS resources uh, to mutual aid requests from other counties statewide. A Mohawk is also responsible for monitoring, ensuring, and procuring medical and health resources for both local emergencies and disasters, as well as for other counties' mutual aid requests. In other words, if our county has a major disaster, then the mutual aid system is prepared to assist us with our emergency response personnel and equipment needs as well, in the same way that we did uh, in Napa. The North Bay firestorm began on Sunday, October 8, 2017, with the Diablo winds gusting up to 70 miles per hour, fueling more than a dozen wildfires across multiple North Bay counties. In the early hours on Monday morning uh, of October the 9th, just after midnight, statewide, the Mohawks, so all of the people like me in every county, received a flash alert from the Regional Disaster Medical Health Coordinator about the major fires in the North Bay. We didn't know what was yet to come. Three hours later, just before three in the morning, I received another notice requesting immediate ambulances to help evacuate 30 patients from a skilled nursing facility. Quickly after, another request came in for immediate ambulances, um, which was issued to help evacuate Kaiser Hospital in Santa Rosa, which is a very large hospital. <clears throat> American Medical Response, AMR, our local ambulance provider, was able to send an advanced life support ambulance and crew and a supervisor unit up to um, Santa Rosa to help out. The calls for mutual aid kept coming in with requests for bed availability at skilled nursing facilities to help receive some of the evacuated patients. The two AMR units drove with lights and sirens all the way from Santa Cruz to Santa Rosa where they were surrounded by fire. By the time they got up there, AMR was suddenly diverted from the Kaiser Hospital evacuation over to Sutter Hospital in Santa Rosa, another large hospital having to evacuate. When AMR arrived, the Sutter Hospital sign was burning. In the parking lots, the grounds workers were attempting to put out small fires, and inside the hospital was full of smoke, which is very difficult for very ill people to breathe. The AMR ambulance evacuated the last patient from this facility. This was a burn patient who was critically injured as she narrowly escaped the fire on foot from her rural home. In order to recognize the responders, could you please come up as your name is called? Um, and Supervisor Leopold, will you please recognize the first group? Thank you, Brenda. Thank you. 
Uh, I'd like to invite the following responders to come to the front. And you could be at the lectern. From America, America Medical Response, Greg Benson, Brian Smith, Courtney Dimple, and Chris Jones. Any of them here today? Yes, sir. All right, please come forward. Uh, Greg is a paramedic supervisor, and he was dispatched to Santa Rosa, where he led an ambulance strike team. Brian and Courtney are paramedics who responded with an advanced life support ambulance to Sutter Santa Rosa Hospital to evacuate patients due to threatening fires and severe smoke in the building. Chris is an operation manager, and we are presenting to Chris today on behalf of AMR a proclamation that recognizes American medical response of Santa Cruz County. Uh, to Greg, Brian, Courtney, and Chris, we extend our thanks and recognition for your willingness to respond immediately to an unknown and dangerous such situation and help people in need. Please join me in thanking them. to the microphone at once. <laughs> sure. Um, thank you everyone for the recognition. Um, these are just a small subsample of what we do every day um, with all of our fire partners and law partners just to work in the community and you know we're a very integrated community or county with our responses to all emergency incidents and uh, from the dispatchers down to the mechanics that work on all of our vehicles. Um, I'll, Thank you for the recognition. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Leopold. Continuing on with the same fire, severe fire weather conditions continued through the night and ignited the hills. By Monday morning, Governor Brown had declared a state of emergency in five North Bay counties. <clears throat> By Tuesday in Napa County, another large residential facility was under threat. This was the Yauntville, California Veterans Home with over 1,000 residents. A partial evacuation was ordered at that time. Supervisor Caput, could you please make the next presentations? Uh, thank you. Uh, this is a wonderful opportunity to thank people that uh, are first responders and uh, it's our way of showing that we are backing you up, uh, but you're the ones that are actually going out there. You're on the front line, so thank you. I'd like to invite the following responders to come to the front from Central Coast Ambulance in Watsonville, Jessica Campa and Vanessa Merenshaw. Uh, Jessica, you're also um, accepting a proclamation uh, for your uh, EMS partner who's un unable to be here, and that would be David Slater. And Jessica and David are emergency medical technicians, and on Tuesday, October 10th, 2017, they were deployed to the Yountville Veterans Facility to assist with the partial evacuation. They evacuated veterans for 12 straight hours. Vanessa is general manager for Central Coast Ambulance, and we are presenting to Vanessa on behalf of your company a uh, proclamation recognizing Central Coast Ambulance. To Jessica, David, and Vanessa, thank you for your willingness to immediately respond to this emergency and for helping evacuate our veterans to a safe location. to you and uh, I'm, I'm curious I just would like to ask you uh, you did have to drive down from here to get up there and probably took what a couple hours to get to Yountville 
And what did you see when you first got there? Uh, just kind of describe the scene uh, that uh, that you were that you were faced with when you got up there. When we first arrived to the area, it was um, Im extremely smoky. You can see ash falling onto the windshield. Um, there was smoke coming from over the mountains, and um, it was really hard to see uh, far away, which normally would be on a clear day, miles. But, yeah. It's and uh, with the uh, veterans, you were dealing with all ages up there, I guess, also. And so, uh, how, did, what did, how did you first respond and help with the evacuation? Um, by the time that we were there to help evacuate, we had dealt with several different patients, whether they were in wheelchairs or had um, the need to be completely laid flat or different needs for each person, but they each came very uniquely and we dealt with each as according. And lastly, where did you evacuate them to? We evacuated them to a church gym. There was Red Cross there and they had um, many beds put out and so they accommodated the patients as needed and they helped kind of keep information separate per patient as well. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. Later that day, the California governor increased the level of emergency at the Yauntville Veterans Facility and ordered a complete evacuation of the premises, which was multiple hundreds of folks. <clears throat> By 5.30 p.m., additional evacuations had begun in Napa and Sonoma counties um, in other uh, facilities as well. Santa Cruz County continued to receive additional mutual aid requests for ambulances that went on for days, um, every few hours. Both Boulder Creek Fire District and Ben Loman Fire Protection District responded to the request by sending a single basic life support ambulance staffed with volunteers to assist with the evacuations. Upon their arrival, personnel from Boulder Creek and Ben Loman Fire Protection Districts became part of a large ambulance strike team which was in place in Napa County uh, to help with all of the evacuations there. Participating in an ambulance strike team was a new experience for everyone involved. Supervisor McPherson, will you please make the next presentation? Thank you. <clears throat> Proudly so. I'd like to invite the following six responders to come, front, come up front. Um, from the Boulder Creek, wow. Is that a celebration? Is that in recognition of you or what? But uh, uh, from Boulder Creek Fire Protection District, I'd like to invite up uh, to the front Josh Clark, Ben Slaughter, and Fire Chief Kevin McLish, who incidentally was named San Rosa Valley's uh, Man of the Year last year. From the Ben Lomond Fire Protection District, Matt Boyden, Boynton. Uh, this is a legend. I mean, this is, I think he's third generation up in the valley uh, fighting uh, or responding to people who are in great need, so congratulations. Xavier Chavez and Fire Chief Stacy Brownlee, who incidentally um, performed, as you may have seen, uh, two phenomenal uh, rescues in the waters along with her colleagues from the Ben Loman Fire De Department a couple of years ago. Josh and Ben are volunteer firefighters and emergency medical technicians with the F Boulder Creek Fire Protection District. Over the course of four days, Josh and Ben assisted with the, the evacuation of hundreds of residents from the Yauntville, California Veterans Facility. After assisting with evacuations for four days, they were then deployed to the Queen of the Valley Hospital in Napa to triage and transport additional patients to skilled nursing facilities. We'd also like to recognize Chief McClish for his leadership with a proclamation for the Molar Creek Fire Protection District. Xavier and Matt are volunteer firefighters and EMTs from Ben Lomond Fire Protection District. Over five days, 
Xavier and Matt participated in ambulance strike teams evacuating Yonville residents. We'd also like to recognize Chief Brownlee, who I don't think is here today, for her leadership with a proclamation for the Ben Lomond Fire District. To Josh, Ben, and Kevin on behalf of Boulder Creek Fire Protection District and Matt, Xavier, and Stacy on behalf of the Ben Lomond Fire District, we thank you for immediately responding to a dangerous and difficult situation. You are the people that nobody really wants to see, but boy, they're sure glad when you arrive. So thank you very much, and I'll come down and give you some proclamation. of all of us. I think we're just lucky and blessed to have the opportunity to go and help and do our part. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> 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 a few words. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you for recognizing us for doing that and also for my family, for the generations of uh, service. And um, as Xavier put it, we were just happy to be able to go up and help. Um, moments notice, be able to just kind of Pick up and go. Just really quick, uh, we weren't able to go up and actually help to fight the fires up there with the fire engine. So, uh, for us to be able to, um, you know, help a, a community out that really needed what we could provide was uh, an honor for us. So, uh, for you guys, tremendous work. I know you guys uh, work night and day, uh, not a lot of sleep, not a lot of food, hitting the quick stops and everything for whatever you can find. Um, but just for you guys, great work. That's all I have. All right, thank you. Thank you, Stan, all the time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Well, smoke from the North Bay fires created unprecedented levels of unhealthy air as we even experienced down here. Officials issued air quality warnings to the entire Bay Area and noted that masks may not be effective and advised residents to stay indoors. Santa Cruz County was now receiving additional mutual aid requests for respiratory medications and therapies to be sent to the North Bay Area to help with the patients up there who were being affected by the air quality. Santa Cruz County has an active coalition for health and medical preparedness called CHAMPS, made up of a lot of our community medical partners who all come together to help out in times of disaster and need, um, both inside our county as well as, in this case, outside of our county. We notified CHAMPS with the requests for the needed medical supplies for respiratory treatments. An alert was sent out via the California Health Alert Network, which is an emergency notification system used locally and by the state for medical and health emergencies for those medical supplies. Um, a robust supply was procured of respiratory treatment medications and supplies and then deployed to the North Bay area. Supervisor Coonerty, will you please make the next presentations? Sure. So I'd like to invite the following people to come forward. From Hearts and Hands Post-Acute Care and Rehab, Donna Honahy. From Santa Cruz Post-Acute, Rusty Grunt, Griner, Sabrina Castro, and Oscar Bueno. And from the County Health Services Agency Homeless Persons Health Project, Jody Cartagini. Donna represent, anyone here? Anyone y'all wanna come forward? There we go. <laughs> Took a little work. Yeah. All right, 
Um, so, Donna represents Hearts and Hands Post Acute Care and Rehab, who donated 1,000 nebulizers and Abitrol uh, treatments. Rusty, Sabrina, and Oscar represent Santa Cruz Post Acute, who donated seven new, uh, nebulizers with medications and other respiratory treatments. Joey is the health services, health center manager of the Homeless Persons Health Project, and he secured medical supplies and machines from HSA clinics and transported them to Santa Rosa on his day off. To Donna, Rusty, Sabrina, and Oscar, thank you for your generous donation of medical supplies and respiratory medic medications to the patients who needed them. And to Joey, HSA Clinics, uh, and HSA, a HSA HPHP Project, thank you for your outstanding support in a time of need. Let me come up. just shows that every little bit helps. Here we are. I'm here. I'm Rusty? Thank you. There you are. Sorry, I'm Would late. You like to <laughs> so I don't know what I just missed. I'm sorry. <laughs> Something came up in the building. Um, it was an emergency, but it's resolved now. Um, but I believe this is in regards to this is the fire evacuation. So yeah, I'm just thrilled to help out in any way possible. I mean, our main purpose, I think if we're relieving the most amount of pain, we're going to be the most successful in the community. And anything we can do to relieve pain, whether it's in our facility or out in the community, um, I think it will um, benefit everyone. And that's what we're committed to doing at Santa Cruz post Acute. So thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. The North Bay fires continued for weeks and were not fully contained until October 31st. In total, two major hospitals were evacuated, as well as seven skilled nursing facilities, the Sonoma Developmental Center, and the Yauntsville Veterans Facility. <coughs> Excuse me. Over a three-week period, there were 15 ambulance strike teams deployed that involved a total of 97 ambulances and 334 EMS personnel from all over the state. This large fire had turned into a very large medical response as well. Meanwhile, in Santa Cruz, we were busy responding to a hepatitis A outbreak when the Bear Fire erupted near Boulder Creek. On October 17th at 1.45 in the morning, one week after the North Bay firestorm started, a 10-acre fire began in the Santa Cruz Mountains requiring evacuation of residents. During the effort to put out the fire, a Cal firefighter tumbled 50 feet down a steep ravine, and as his crewmates rescued him, they also fell down the canyon as the trail continued to erode. One of the firefighters was seriously injured when his fall was suddenly stopped by a large boulder. He broke many bones from the fall, including his nose and jaw. The hillside continued to erode, with debris and boulders continuing to fall onto all of the rescuers. An AMR supervisor arrived at the scene, where he grabbed a backboard and descended to assist with the injured. A firefighter from Boulder Creek Fire Protection District also descended with additional rescue supplies. They reached the injured firefighter and strapped him to a board. He had to be carried across a moving creek to an opening where he could be safely evacuated. Uh, at the top of the ravine, coordinated efforts with the Santa Cruz County Cal Fire, led by Felton Fire Protection District, were being taken to bring the injured and the remaining responders up the cliff with a rope rescue system. It was quite a, um, quite a harrowing uh, situation. An AMR ambulance was waiting to accept the patient and transport him to a helicopter rendezvous site. A life flight helicopter then transported the patient to a trauma center. While this rescue was occurring, the fire illuminated the light sky and was raging toward them, and I did hear stories that the fire was actually surrounding them where they were at. By 5 a.m., the fire had burned 100 acres. 
and the Santa Cruz County Emergency Operations Center was activated along with two general population shelters for people displaced by the fire evacuations. In all, five firefighters in the, uh, were injured in the fall or by the falling rocks. The entire team worked together to be sure everyone got to safety. The ambulance and helicopter crews took great care of everyone who was injured, and despite the massive response to assist the North Bay fires, our own region was ready to respond locally. Chair Friend, will you please make this final presentation? Thank you. We do remember this remarkable story, and I'd like to invite the following responders up to, to the front from Santa Clara Cal Fire, Andy Goodson, Eric Long, Richard Murray, and Brandon Neal. From AMR, Greg Benson, Tyler Broom, and Scott Campbell. From Boulder Creek Fire Protection District, Ben Slaughter, if you wouldn't mind coming back up for us. From the Felton Fire Protection District, Robert Gray. From Santa Cruz County Cal Fire, Tim Fox, Josh Roman, and Austin Rugg. And from Stanford Life Flight, Emily Otto, Becky Jackson, and David White. I think you all fit. <laughs> so Eric, Richard, Brandon, and Andy are with Santa Clara Cal Fire, and they were firefighters uh, turned ravine rescuers on this mission. While responding to the Bear Fire, they risked their own lives to save one of their own in a very dangerous conditions. Greg, a paramedic supervisor with AMR, carried a backboard down a ravine into a creek to locate the injured firefighter, while Tyler and Scott, paramedics with AMR, operated the ambulance. Ben, a volunteer firefighter from Boulder Creek Fire, was another rescuer at the ravine where he risked his life to save the life of another firefighter in very dangerous conditions. Division Chief Gray from Felton Fire supervised the rope evacuation. Captain Fox from Santa Cruz County Fire, Cal Fire, along with firefighters John and Austin, assisted with the rope evacuation of the injured firefighter. Emily and Becky, who are flight nurses with Stanford Life Flight and always deal with very difficult situations every day, cared for the patient while pilot David White flew the helicopter, and if it weren't for the outstanding teamwork performed by all the rescuers that you see here today, a firefighter may have lost his life. Thank you for your willingness to risk your lives for the help of others, and thank you for your service to our county. It's a remarkable story. So I was the one that was uh, uh, evacuated via helicopter. So um, now I get to see everybody's face. Uh, I really just appreciate everything you guys have done for me, uh, all my fire family. Um, you know, you hear a lot about uh, like the brotherhood and the sisterhood of the first responder community. Um, and when something like this happens, it's just really awesome to see everybody just come together and help each other. And you know, it's, it's obviously very stressful and. Uh, and a hard thing to uh, deal with. But I just want to say thank you to everyone involved. Um, it really means a lot to me. And uh, I'm really, uh, really honored and looking forward to hopefully getting back to work here in the next month or so. So thank you all. like to share some words about this incident? I'll go ahead and speak. Thank you. It was remarkable coordination. Yes, it was. Um, in this type of incident, you know, usually there's a lot of coordination and stuff going on. Uh, this was probably one of the most streamlined rescues I've ever been a part of. Um, everybody knew what their job was and just went to work. There was um, very little leadership that needed to be bestowed upon these folks. They pretty much did it for me. So um, I'd like to thank everybody who was part of this um, for doing just such a great job and you know, making me proud to be in charge of 
is a great group of people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. <clears throat> By working together and providing and receiving mutual aid response, we help each other overcome catastrophic events. As a local Mohawk, I am confident that we as a county can count on our mutual aid, partnering agencies, and neighboring counties to help us should we ever need assistance following a devastating fire, earthquake, or other emergency or disaster. I would also like to recognize the life-saving skills of all of the responders, the firefighters who do what they do, as well as the paramedics and EMTs on the ambulances for risking their lives to help take care of all of us in just the way that they did on that last call. The Emergency Medical Care Commission and the County Emergency Medical Services Program would like to thank the Board of Supervisors for your participation in EMS Week. The dedication and effort of these people and their peers in the EMS community uh, is something we truly value and we really recognize and appreciate your help with that. We have a small reception in the hallway outside of your chambers and invite everyone to join us. And this concludes the EMS Celebration Week for 2018. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We'd like to invite everybody to out into the hallway for the reception. The, you know, the board each year, we do these events and they are just remarkable stories. And also the amount of humility that uh, all of you in public safety have. I mean, you always say the same thing, you're just doing your job, but you're, by doing your job, you're saving people's lives. And just think about the parents, the kids, the friends, the neighbors that wouldn't be here if it weren't for what you did every single day. And you give people an extra day of memories, extra lifetime of memories because of your service every single day. So I do appreciate, the board appreciates all of your service. It means a lot. So the board will recess for 15 minutes to join, then we'll come back in uh, for a closed session. Before we go into closed session, will we, there be anything reportable? Yes. Hello, how about you? No. Is there anybody from the community that would like to address us on closed session before we recess for 15 minutes and go into closed session? All right, seeing none, the board will recess for 15 minutes and then enter into closed session. Call back into session the Board of Supervisors, and we're going to do our 130 scheduled item, which is item 57, which is a public hearing to consider application 171179, a proposal to amend the general plan land use designation and zoning from community commercial C2 to service commercial C4 and construct an automobile dealership with service facility, including consideration of adoption of a mitigation monitoring and reporting program and a statement of overriding considerations, and certification of a final EIR as recommended by the Planning Commission. We have a number of attachments, including the board memo, the resolution, the rezoning ordinance, the conditions of approval, the mitigation monitoring and reporting program, the Planning Commission resolution, the Planning Commission minutes, the Planning Commission staff report, the transport vehicle turning radius, and a number of comments and correspondence. And just note that we have received all of your correspondence that we've uh, been written to over this over the last uh, quite some time, so we have received all that. A number of them are actually here attached uh, to the agenda, and we'll start with a planning department staff presentation. Good afternoon, welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, Nate McBeth, planning department. <clears throat> Uh, the Planning Commission held a public hearing on April 25th, 2018, and after consideration of all the information, uh, unanimously voted to recommend the Board of Supervisors approve application 171179. All findings can be made uh, to, the, to approve the proposal. 
the general plan amendment and rezoning is appropriate due to the location of the project site uh, and surrounding uh, development. Uh, the project as condition will reduce potential environmental impacts to the greatest extent feasible. Environmental review has been required uh, per the requirements of the California Environmental Quality Act. Uh, attached in the staff report are details, uh, extensive information regarding the analysis of the project. As noted, the project would result in significant and unavoidable traffic impacts to both Highway 1 and temporal impacts at the intersection of Soquel Drive and Robertson Street. These impacts require the board to uh, make findings of fact and a statement of overriding consideration which evaluate the benefits of the project um, against the identified significant environmental impacts. Uh, findings of fact and statement of overriding considerations in your packet. Uh, the position of the Planning Commission <clears throat> was that the traffic congestion on Soquel Drive um, in the vicinity of the project is not acceptable and should be addressed by the county as soon as possible. The Commission's motion included a strong recommendation to your board uh, that the signalization of the intersection of Soquel Drive and Robertson should be completed within three years of the auto dealership becoming operational rather than five years. <clears throat> it's recommended that, uh, it's, it's a recommendation of staff uh, that your board acknowledge the Planning Commission's recommendation by directing the Department of Public Works to prioritize installation of the Soquel Drive and Robertson Street and pursue funding uh, for installation of the signal to ensure this short-term temporal and unavoidable significant traffic impacts are minimized. I'd like to run through a series of slides that kind of give you context of the proposed development. Uh, so there's an intersection of Soquel Drive and 41st Avenue is the project site highlighted in blue. Uh, the one parcel here is not included in the proposed development. The corner here is currently developed with King's paint and paper and an automated car wash or a, a, a self-serve car wash, if you will, and a number of single-family homes. This is a corner looking across the street back at the project site, King's Payne Paper, and the car wash here, running up Soquel Drive away from 41st Avenue. This is the, again, the car wash. Uh, these are the homes that were proposed for demolition but have since been abated as a public nuisance. This is south of the project site as an automated car wash. Looking across 41st Avenue from the project site, we have uh, Redwood Shopping Center. Uh, on the frontage here, we have uh, Starbucks Coffee, Subway, and Panda Express. Inside the uh, shopping center, we have Safeway, also a Safeway gas station, Best Buy, and Home Depot. Looking across Soquel Drive from the project site is Ocean Honda. This is a proposed general plan designation amendment uh, converting the project site highlighted here as uh, to uh, from community commercial to service commercial. So existing zoning changing to service commercial and the surrounding zone districts. The site improvements include demolition of existing uh, structures approximately 14,000 square feet and to construct a 12,000 square foot dealership, a 10,000 square foot service facility up here in the west, northwest portion of the property. There's removal of approximately eight trees and planting of approximately 50 trees, uh, both on the interior of the site and around the, the periphery of the site. Uh, be a total of parking for uh, 129 cars. That includes customer parking, uh, uh, service vehicles, uh, employees, as well as uh, their inventory. It's an elevation drawing showing what the, the site will look like. Um, we have here main building. This is uh, 41st Avenue. That's what it was seen from 41st Avenue. And this is the elevation drawing of the service bays. This elevation here is seen from uh, Soquel Drive. There's, as part of the project, there's a, um, there's a sign exception being requested. That's to increase the uh, number of allowed signs. Uh, there's uh, several uh, monument signs as well as the total number of si total square footage of the signage exceeds uh, 50 square feet, which is required or which is allowed by code. Uh, it's pretty typical that large developments, um, uh, large sites, corner sites, uh, 
development that's set back sufficiently, uh, set back from the, from the road, uh, apply for a sign exception. Similar sign exceptions have been applied for and granted in the, in the, in the vicinity, it includes Ocean Honda uh, and Redwood Shopping Center. This is a view of Soquel Drive. This is an existing shot again and a proposed rendering of the site. Um, Off-site improvements would include uh, uh, sidewalks and landscaping along the project frontage, uh, sidewalks extending uh, west of the project site and south of the project site. Um, there would be a dedicated right turn lane on Soquel Drive uh, onto 41st Avenue, uh, right turn lane on at Soquel and Porter Street. This is uh, away from the project site slightly. Uh, this would be a, um, only during certain times of the, times of the day. Otherwise, it would be utilized as a uh, loading zone. And there will be funding uh, for uh, the signalization of the Soquel, uh, Soquel Drive and Robertson intersection. This is a, kind of a bird's eye view of the project site in context of the surrounding development. Right turn lane here is proposed. Um, there, there's a deviation from the, uh, from the approved plan line and that's what the uh, road, roadway roadside exception is required for. Uh, is essentially, it's extending the right turn pocket. It's exceeding the requirement. It was like by another 100, 190 feet or so. So it would be the whole length of the site. Additionally, when the plan line was approved, uh, King's Paint was expected to stay. And so uh, the plan line would basically it required the implementation of the right turn lane, but there would be you know, sidewalk curb gutter sidewalk going out and around King's Paint. Uh, in this case, with King's Paint going away, uh, the, the curb gutter sidewalk can be uh, right in line with the rest of the right of way. So no, wouldn't bulb out right here. This is a look at where the traffic improvements would occur. So again, right turn lane here at the project site. That might be kind of hard to see. This is the intersection of Robertson. And then down here is the highlighted. This is the intersection of Porter and Soquel. Again, that kind of summarizes it. So Porter and Soquel, uh, we're going to do right turn striping, a peak PM. Uh, Soquel and Robertson will include signalization. And a statement of override is required for um, the added trips to Highway 1, which there is no mitigation identified. Uh, we received some public comment since the, um, since the Planning Commission hearing and, and specifically as it relates to uh, turning movements of, uh, of transport vehicles. This is a diagram provided by the applicant. Um, it demonstrates that a 65-foot uh, automobile transport vehicle is uh, able to navigate the entrance to the site. Essentially, they would come down Soquel Drive. I actually have another. This is that turn here. So this is a 65-foot vehicle coming down Soquel Drive, making a right turn onto 41st Avenue. Oh, and go back. And then, and then uh, into the project site, the loading or unloading would occur in this location, leaving sufficient clearance for vehicles to continue to use that, that entrance. So in consideration of all the material that's been submitted, um, <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> uh, staff feels that the project is consistent with all applicable codes and policies, including the zoning ordinance and general plan, and therefore recommends that your board adopt the attached resolution, adopting a mitigation monitoring and reporting program, statement of overriding consideration, and certify the final environmental impact report per the requirements of California Environmental Quality Act, and approve the general plan land use designation amendment the project site from community commercial to service commercial and a zone district amendment for the project site and approve commercial development permit under application 171-179 with the attached findings and conditions. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. McBeth. Are there questions from board members before we open up the public hearing? Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, thanks for the presentation. I had some questions, though, that I wanted to ask. Um, 
on the, there was a last slide before this, which you went through pretty quickly. I wonder if you could explain again the, the question about the trucks and being able to get in there. There, there, there are a number of uh, 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 emails and concerns raised by a constituent about whether a, a transport truck would actually be able to get in there effectively. Um, I understand that we have, uh, that you're recommending that they only be allowed to do it inside. Uh, the the facility, mm -hmm. um, but uh, could you just explain a little bit about this picture and what it's telling us about uh, the ability to be able to make this uh, this turns or this entryway? Yeah, sure. Um, it's my understanding that this model represents the, the the turning movements, the various where the wheels would be, so to speak. So, in this diagram, it shows the vehicle having to swing rather wide, but able to navigate this corner with sufficient clearance between the various curbs, uh, both here on the corner. And there, there may actually need to be a slight realignment here, but the vehicle will, will make that turn. And um, then, yeah, and then as it enters the site here, it's tight, but it does make the, the clearance. It just shows the various, you know, how the wheels meander as its various turning movements. And then, yeah, and parking here. Yeah, and as you mentioned, a condition of approval requires that they, the transport vehicles would only be allowed to uh, load and unload on the project site. There was, as you said, some concern about uh, the use of SoCal Drive, and, and we're prepared to uh, recommend that they're only allowed to. Yeah, and I, I, and I know, because I've checked, I mean, previous to this application, I didn't really get complaints about uh, uh, unloading of vehicles from the Honda dealership. Uh, which I understand, uh, I know happens uh, now, but we don't have any uh, uh, permitting or encroachment uh, requirements for people who want to do that. Is that is that accurate? In, in terms of? Well, I mean, so the Honda dealership across the street, uh, for instance, offloads their, uh, some of their cars in the, in the center lane. Mm -hmm. uh, but we don't have any, uh, there, there's nothing in our code that says you have to get an encroachment permit. Is that correct? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, and for this, if if the if we're inaccurate about them getting to be able to transport truck and um, uh, since the permit requires it, what happens if the if they, they would have to make changes to their physical layout if Correct. this didn't work because the permit requires that they that they would have to do it on site. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, the uh, um, I wanted to ask a couple questions uh, w about the traffic study. Um, there was uh, concerns raised to me about what the definition was that we used um, uh, to figure out the counts. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if you could explain the difference between the categories that, w that were uh, considered uh, and why we chose the one that we did in order to make the traffic counts. Right. Um, there was uh, some correspondence from the um, applicant, uh, the traffic engineer, and uh, basically clarifying that. It was a discussion we had at the Planning Commission hearing, uh, some concerns raised. Uh, but yeah, essentially, uh, the use code that was used was for auto sales, and um, it's uh, for auto sales dealerships. Uh, typically located on large arterial, arterial streets and characterized by abundant of commercial development surrounding automobile services. Uh, parts sales, substantially used, car, you know, used cars are also allowed. And so that was the category that they selected. There were a couple other ones, which would be auto care centers. It would be like, um, it'd be maybe like a, like a quickie lube where they're just processing vehicles one after another and um, automobile parks and service centers. So that would be like maybe a smog check place that also does transmissions and uh, basically a series of auto related uh, uses. So the, the, <clears throat> so the category that, that was chosen automobile sales, mm -hmm. um, it says auto services and parts sales, but that also includes the maintenance or it doesn't include the it maintenance? It does include the maintenance. And yes. that's, that's common. It's, we don't have to add these two uh, uh, sections together no. to get the traffic in. No. Um, the, uh, uh, to, to me, one of the big issues here is, uh, is going to be the impacts on traffic. Um, and the, uh, the staff report talks that, that there, there is a solution in terms of a light 
Um, and there's a question whether, you, whether it's acceptable to have five years or something else. Um, but, there, but even if we had a perfect solution for um, uh, the lighting, um, we would still have a statement of overriding consideration because of the highway. That's relatively new. Could you explain why we have that and where we will see that again? Yeah. Um, Let me take that one. If you'd like. Uh, um, Kathy Malloy, Planning Director. As you know, uh, Regional Transportation Commission and Caltrans, et cetera, continue to work on trying to identify uh, Highway 1 improvement project and uh, identify funding to implement the project through its course. But in the meantime, before we have such an identified program, program which would be a programmatic mitigation measure, uh, there, there is not a, a mitigation measure that we can point to. So particularly when you have uh, projects that are controversial, um, then where you want to be dot every I and cross every T, um, you do an environmental impact report, which basically says, you know, the standard is any trip added to during a peak hour, you know, isn't going to be mitigable. And so we're making a, a finding, we're providing that information and making a finding, recommending and making a finding of statement of override. In the future, we hope not to have to take projects through this course. And there are two um, potential opportunities that will um, allow for that. The AMBAG and RTC uh, are, will be considering an EIR very soon on the Regional <coughs> Sustainable Community Strategy Multipolitan Tr Transportation Plan, and that document has um, included information about the lack of mitigation for Highway 1. And so when that EIR is certified and actions flowing from that EIR will also need a statement of override. Additionally, when we do the Sustainable Santa Cruz uh, General Plan update, uh, we will be doing a, a master environmental impact report and that same type of information and mitigation strategy and statement of override will be, uh, will be part of that package. Obviously in the ensuing time, you know, if there is a um, mitigation program identified, then, you know, maybe that won't be necessary, but sitting here today, it doesn't look like we're going to come up with a, a project and a funding strategy that's going to enable level of service D on Highway 1, yeah. so it's... Well, someone who was very involved with the last funding strategy for well, the Regional Transportation Commission, I know that that's, that's not a deep well uh, beyond what was already funded, but what, whatever, w whether we chose this project, um, a mixed-use project, a, a commercial project, or even the alternative site uh, that was, you would still have a statement of overriding consideration because of that issue. Correct. Okay. Um, the, um, there was also uh, some concern that uh, we're, we're doing this project without taking into consideration the other sustainable Santa Cruz County pieces. Um, uh, uh, I know that I've been a bit of advocate for uh, uh, getting the EIR done on our sustainable Santa Cruz County. What will that EIR be taking a look at? The uh, in regards to the, the, the corridor that we're, that we're talking about here, I know there's, there's a lot of different pieces to it. There's a lot of different pieces to it. You know, with respect to this corridor and the upper 41st Avenue uh, in particular, it was a focus area. And um, some of its policy ideas really were, were more oriented toward uh, the adjacent properties where all the lumber storage is. San Lorenzo Lumber Storage, that's a very large piece of property. Also ProBuild, more at the corner of Highway 1, very large piece of property, you know, lumber storage. And so and that those two sites and, and additional properties, more in the interior of the upper 41st focus area, have, have a lot of vacant and underutilized land. Sure. And the, the policy, land use policies that have been that were discussed in Sustainable Santa Cruz was that that perhaps could become more of an employment center. Um, and so we talked about the concept of a workplace flex where it wouldn't just be, you know, heavy industrial or heavy commercial or office, but it would be a workplace flex where you could do uh, almost, almost like the sash mill where you have it, it, all kinds of workspaces going on, some light assembly, some office. You can also have cafes and dry cleaner there so that workers don't have to get in their cars and drive away to services. So that was the policy idea that was really the central part of the upper 41st Avenue. Frankly, this particular site along the frontage of um, 
41st Avenue uh, wasn't given a whole lot of attention. It was it was general commercial and C2 and and it was just sort of contemplated to remain the same. The focus was in the more the interior of the area. And, and that'll look at the, all the cum cumulative impacts of all those different changes yes, that are possible. Yes, that, that'll be what the EIR addresses is uh, it'll, we'll be taking the the 2040 population and employment forecasts and just as the you know the RTC AMBAG EIR is doing right now we'll be we'll be echoing that if you will and and showing where uh, population employment growth to 2040 where we think that is likely to land and we'll make certain land use development assumptions and we'll run you know we'll do traffic modeling and of uh, key intersections and highway 1 and We'll look, be looking for mitigations, if, if possible, you know, to identify improvement projects that might help, and that'll all happen with the master EIR. Yeah. Um, and the, the last thing, and I'm, I'm not sure this is a question that we can answer right now, but the, the, the issue of the light, you know, it, it seems to me that w whatever um, an individual's choice is for what happens on this property, that the that adding a light at Robertson is a way in which you can uh, alleviate the impact. Um, that's going to occur there or with any other development along the corridor. Um, why is five years, not three years? I think initially the EIR, you know, we, we sort of uh, put out that time frame as um, kind of echoing what impact fee law says, is that when you take impact fees, you're kind of supposed to spend them within five years. And so, you know, it seemed like that was a, a reasonable time frame. Also, because the current uh, capital improvement program of the county does not identify f and commit funding to that project. And so, you know, it would need to be considered by your board and, you know, some different priorities established. And so that was thought that it was probably going to take a little bit of time. Um, but yes, because that, that improvement has not been there's, uh, designed um, and and all of that. So those processes just take time. Yeah. Uh, I know the Planning Commission, you know, was uh, very supportive of trying to minimize that time to the extent possible and talk with the Public Works Department about that. And, and I think, you know, staff would certainly be receptive to your board's direction to do that and prioritize it for, for grants um, and, and, and any available funding. Uh, it's a, it's a well-positioned project to attract funding because uh, the traffic conditions are so poor um, and it's highly, heavily used and a very needed improvement that will that will make a difference. Yeah, the light seems critical. I don't, I don't know how we do this without the uh, would do anything there without the light. So that's all the questions I have. Thank you. Is there any supervisor Caput? You bet. <laughs> I guess we're always looking at uh, benefit versus burden. Every project has that, and I'm looking at. Uh, uh, well, you answered pretty much the three-year, five-year. But let's say all grant funding doesn't come through. I mean, that's always a possibility. I, we've seen it. Uh, then we're going to have to pay for it out of what the general fund and uh, for the uh, the signalization of that area. Well, the the staff recommendation is that um, the board, in conjunction with this recommended action, would basically impose a requirement on the county to build the signal within five years. That's the sure. staff recommendation. The applicant would be required to pay their fair share of the contribution to the impact, which uh, we've, we've redone the math because the, the estimated cost of the traffic signal has increased. Um, but in any event, the, the applicant would be required to pay his, his fair share, and the, <coughs> the rest of the funding would need to be identified by the county. And st from staff's perspective, we think that allowing for five years is, is reasonable, even though we can try and make every effort to shorten that time frame. Uh, imposing a requirement ourselves for five years is what's recommended. And the projected uh, sales uh, tax revenue that comes in is uh, about, what, 200000 a year or something like that? I actually don't know that number. Okay. Uh, yes, we did some preliminary estimates, and it's um, it's really hard to predict, but generally a good number would be about $200,000 a year. So five times 200000 is a million. Would that money be able to pay for then maybe the uh, signal? 
I mean, that will be a decision of your board going forward in, in every, as you adopt budgets and capital improvement programs. Okay, and then of course, uh, environmental concerns I always have are, um, if we're looking at <coughs> uh, landscaping and all that, uh, and sidewalks and uh, parking uh, of the vehicles, is it permeable uh, asphalt that they're gonna put in where the water will be able to go through? That's correct. That's correct, okay. And then what about uh, more trees uh, for landscaping? Uh, I know Soquel and that, that whole area, it's a beautiful area. I'd hate to see not, uh, not an, I'd, I'd rather see more trees than not enough trees. So can we increase the number of trees on the landscaping and that's more shade, more carbon banking? Yeah, there's about 50 trees planted and the number of, increasing the number of trees may, may be restricted by spacing of those trees. Well, sure, uh, but I mean, 50 is not very much for 2.6 acres. Mm -hmm. yeah. We anyway, could certainly uh, look at that. That's a yeah. possibility we could increase that. Wait, that, as a point of clarification, I think it, I it is 50 new trees, actually, specifically, correct? 50 new correct? trees, yeah. correct, yeah. Yeah, but that uh, some trees will go down, right? They'd be required to maintain the trees in perpetuity. So okay. if, yeah. And then uh, are sidewalks and the turn, turn lane, are they included? Uh, how much is that gonna cost in addition to the signal change? Um, th those are costs that will be um, <clears throat> assumed by the applicant. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I'm curious, where, where uh, a car dealership, where do they get, uh, get the gasoline for the cars? Uh, do they have an on-site uh, uh, gas pumps? There's no on-site storage of gasoline. So, so they have to go to the gas station like all of us? I, I believe so. Perhaps the applicant would Is that true? be better at Yeah. So. Okay, so that's traffic going back and forth to... Uh, the gas station to fill up the cars or whatever. Um, maybe the applicant could could maybe further explain how gas, you know, how the gas, but that. yeah, the trip generation for that would account any vehicle to or from originating at the site or coming to the site. Yeah, I, I know when they sell a car, they always, well, my understanding, they always fill it up uh, for the customer when they drive off. So they have to go somewhere to get that gasoline. And uh, that's it. Thank you. We usually have the applicant tip the Are there any other questions for board members before we open up the public hearing? I believe we begin with the applicant. Is that correct from a structural standpoint? Yeah, right. Um, so we'd like to invite the applicant up. Do we have that other? Mr. Gopetti, uh, how much time would you need for your presentation? Maybe 10 minutes. Maybe uh, seven minutes. All right, let's let's make it seven then. Okay, we have you got it. We want to Perfect. make sure that people have an opportunity. Perfect. Um, I don't know whether my presentation really isn't very long. Um, just some basics. Uh, we are family business. Uh, no, has no bearing on land use, but uh, we are. Um, we we look forward. We think we put a good project together along with uh, along with staff. Uh, there's been. Lots of changes from how I would like this project to have been if I was designing it without any restrictions. Um, but I understand that the need to the need to make those modifications. Uh, I believe that also the the additional uh, 1,300 feet of a sidewalk that extend beyond our project, uh, ADA sidewalks and curb and gutter uh, that go past the lumber yard and and down to past the cruise car wash and down to the next intersection there on, on, on 40, uh, 41st is a, is a significant improvement uh, beyond just our, our project improvements. Um, you, you've done the math on, the, on some sales tax revenue, the, the employment uh, we, we believe will begin with 25, we currently have about 10, so we'll be doubling our staff uh, and at some point in the first three to four years we should be bringing that staff up to 45, maybe 50, 50 people that will be working within the dealership. Um, vehicle deliveries is a big concern. Um, I have a letter from Nissan. I don't know whether it was in, put in your packet or not. Uh, again, I said that there's... It was. Okay, good. All right. Um, I, I, I just heard from, from Kathy that they've recalculated the, the mitigation fees that, are, are, that we're gonna have to participate in for the, the stoplight 
Um, I'm assuming that, that the $14,000 that I have in my presentation has gone up, but I haven't heard the new number. Um, and I certainly understand that's a big concern uh, across the board and, and from what, uh, what, what I've heard from staff, what I've heard from our traffic engineers, that this will, this, that mitigation will be a significant improvement to that. So I would like at this point in time to say whatever Kathy's got the fees calculated at for that project, I'm willing to up that to $200,000 so that my contribution to that signalization is, is a much larger portion of the, of the, of, of the project versus probably the 28 or 30,000 that uh, is, is our fee. Um, dedicated right turn lane, the new sidewalks. You guys know everything about the project. I don't, there's not a lot to talk about here other than I really think we'll be a good member of the community. Uh, we, we support uh, kids' causes and, and less fortunate children, and we, we do a heck of a job of that, and we plan on continuing that, so your consideration is appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for only taking three minutes of that. Uh, <laughs> you weren't asking about the trees, I think. Yeah, Supervisor Cap, I did have a brief question. Well, our, our, our guests uh, would be at the, at, the, at the car wash next door to us. Um, without the, the illustrations up on the screens, um, there's, there's a couple of methods that can happen. Number one, when we get a vehicle delivered to us, um, we have to take that vehicle out on a test drive after we made sure all the oil and everything's in it. We could certainly fill the cars up with gas prior to delivery, which would, uh, which would take care of most of the situations. Uh, the next thing that's possible, I, I, I say possible from, from a layman's, uh, layman's stance, uh, is that there is, a, there is a small easement that comes out of the car wash. Uh, on the 40, the people exit the car wash on, on the 41st side, it, it, it would be possible from, from my position to potentially create an opening on my property that leads into that easement so that we could go to and from the car wash without um, en entering on the, any of the main streets. From an efficiency standpoint, that would make a lot of sense to me in place of having people get on the 41st, get gas, and then somehow work their way back around to us. Uh, landscaping the trees. Uh. The trees. Um, there's probably three times the trees uh, that I would like, but uh, you know, if more trees are, are are necessary, we can certainly take a look at it. There, there, there is a limited space. I know. T I know. Two point six acres sounds like a a, a lot, um, but I don't know that. Um, I, I think we probably. And I'm 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 making this statement. I had the answer at one point in time, but. We, we have more trees, I believe, on our site than what the, the, the shopping center across the street probably has on a, on a, on a per square foot basis. Yeah, maybe they, they need to add more trees too, though. They might, yeah. <laughs> maybe we can we get together and do an arbor project there or something. Sure. Uh, and uh, any, uh, I didn't see in the report, I, I, I should have looked cl uh, closer, a solar power or uh, we're going to have some of that? Right now, there's no solar panel. There are uh, uh, two or three uh, electric charging stations on the premises, uh, but no solar planned at all right at this point in time. Doesn't mean it won't happen, it's just not planned right now. Okay, and that it is uh, permeable? Uh, all, all, all of the asphalt is permeable, yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions the applicant before we open up the public hearing? Okay, seeing none, can I get a sense of how many people are interested in speaking today, just so I can make sure everybody has an opportunity to speak? Okay. Um, so we're going to have to keep uh, the comments to two minutes to ensure that we actually can hear everybody's uh, comments today. So we're going to open up the public hearing. Please feel free to line up uh, just for efficiency standpoint. And we want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to be heard and all the voices are heard this time. Good afternoon. Welcome. I appreciate you, welcome, you waiting. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, in a different life, I wore a different outfit and I was a parole psychologist for state parole, just quite near where that area is. And I can tell you that the best thing that ever happened to that area is to have it all cleared out because we used to have a lot of our customers in parole living in that area. And you'll save money on your sheriff's calls as well. So I congratulate you guys for sort of private regentrification of the area. The, the other thing is, is that, I, you know, I, where I live, 
There hasn't been a slurry seal put on the road for 25 years. And I see you guys down here just wasting money, all right, and we've got real needs in the county. Other things to do besides harass these guys. I mean, they, the, the, the environmental impact report was crazy. Whoop. Oh, you have time, you have another minute. Okay, yeah, I mean, it's like, it's, it cost them a fortune. All right, it's amazing to me that anybody ever builds anything in Santa Cruz. So it's no wonder that we run into structural deficit on the budget, not if you harass people like this, it's impossible. That's all I have to say. Do you mind providing your name for the record, yeah, sir? Yeah, sure, my name is John Herr. Thank I you. live on Loma Prieta Way. Thank you. If you want a reference to the road that needs some help, well, both do, but. <laughs> Thank you for taking the time. Good afternoon, welcome. Hello, my name is Catherine Sweet. <clears throat> I've lived in, San in Soquel since 62, graduated from Soquel High in 64. Soquel has been a named place since 1833. It's changed a bit since then, but it's where people live and work and play. We raise our families and we send them to the local schools. And we believe that our village and our hills have unique charms and give us a quality of life that we couldn't have anywhere else. And I'm sure that each one of you other supervisors have people in your district that feel the same way about where they live. As a small county, our citizens enjoy unique access to local government in ways that those who live in larger places can't do. I wish I had a dollar, even a dime, for every hour I've spent over the last 40 years going to meetings, working with local officials and joining with my neighbors to try to ensure that our community remains a safe, healthy, happy place to live. Those goals have been seriously challenged in the last few years as the population has increased. Soquel High is now the secondary freeway, even though it was never designed for that, and travels through small business areas and residential areas. Sometimes, and in some places, it becomes either completely gridlocked or a dangerous racetrack. The sustainable plan gave us hope that there would be a clear path forward to deal with future challenges. Regretfully, all of that hard work and money that went into that plan was thrown away by a few people in this building starting sometime in 2015. It doesn't matter what their intentions are. The bottom line is that they didn't care about our community or the current zoning or the sustainable plan and they intentionally tried to shut the public out of the process. The 200 emails that we got from our Freedom of Information Act request. Thank you, Ms. Sweet. Can I finish my last very, paragraph? Very, very, very briefly, please. Um, if it had happened the way that the special favors that were done for this applicant, if it happened, he would be having big balloons celebrating a Memorial Day sale on that thing right now. Thank you. Please honor the SoCal community and turn this back. Thank you. And we have received your letter and your organization's letter as well, Thank just you. so we know. Good afternoon. My name is Vivian Fenner Evans, and I'm a member of Sustainable SoCal. I would like the board to know that the public only became aware of this applicant and the proposal for the Nissan dealership in April of 2017. But according to the Freedom of Information Act filed and received by Sustainable Soquel, over 200 emails were exchanged between 2016 and March 2018. That's two years of emails that were exchanged between the CAO, Susan Mariello, Kathy Prevasich, Nathan McBeth, the Economic Development um, Department, um, which is, um, sorry, I'm a little nervous, Andy Constable and Barbara Mason. The emails demonstrate that this was not business as usual, a Nissan dealership applying to change zoning, and that the Nissan applicant was given special favors and consideration. 
I ask you, what justifies changing the zoning to accommodate a car dealership? How does the Nissan dealership serve or benefit our community? I urge you to deny the request for a zoning change at this location of 41st Avenue in Soquel. Traffic location, traffic congestion is horrific and defies all logic. Why a car dealership would even be considered by you. But it also defies the 2014 general sustainable plan, the general plan, and the Soquel Village plan. Please, please do not submit to an out-of-county entrepreneur whose only interest is monetary profit at the expense of Soquel, Aptos, and all Santa Cruz residents. Please do not subject us to an attitude that adulates a love of money as superior to a love of the environment, the community, and as residents. Thank you. Thank you. If I could, uh, just before you speak, sir, if I could just request, uh, you're welcome to clap, but just remember that we're trying to make it a welcoming environment for all viewpoints, and so I just, in general, if we could just not be too noisy on that regard, just so everybody feels welcome in this environment. Good afternoon, welcome. Good afternoon, Lord. thank you. My name is Bob Morgan. I also participate with uh, Sustainable Soquel, and I want to make a point before I begin that Ms. Malloy made a comment regarding C2 and C4 um, zoning in that focus area. The area adjacent to the Redwood um, uh, small shopping center there and the Honda dealership was identified in the sustainable plan to go from C4 to C2. So that focus area is actually de-intensifying zoning um, intensity there. there. We are not, we're moving now with this request from the project applicant to rather intensify the zoning. But the sustainable plan is clear. It is asking to detensify the, the zoning. I also want to mention that um, John Leopold has very nicely written um, to all of his constituents to ask for better community th for, through engagement. And he states that it is my belief that good policy and development are born out of a robust public process. This is the result of that robust public process. It is the sustainable plan, and it is a visionary plan. It is not simply a feasibility study. It has uh, received laudatory comments from many organizations, many people in this uh, community, as well as the hard work of many constituents. And I just want to share a couple of the um, comments from the Appendix G of the draft. And this was the hard work that workshops put together and mentioned, and I wanted to mention that letters um, from many organizations are included in this appendix. One of the workshop comments was, increase the density, diversity to mixed use, residential, commercial, office, tech, bio, et cetera. Get people out of the cars and onto their bikes use public transit. There is nothing in this draft document which asks thank us you. to rezone for a parking. Thank you. Um, thank you, and a, and a dealership. Thank, thank you. you. And might I give you this, uh, this appendix? Uh, sure, you can give it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon. Michael Saint with uh, Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. Um, you, you guys are all supervisors. I'd like to bring you back to also being RTC commissioners for a moment. I have a uh, document here, Tra Travel Patterns Chapter 3 of the 2014 Regional Transportation Plan. And this was uh, your study that everyone did there. And basically, bear with me, what it, it talks about is the uh, travel to work by the various cities um, in Santa Cruz County. Watsonville residents do carpooling primarily, much more than other cities. Uh, the residents of Santa Cruz and Capitola use a mixed, uh, different transportation al alternative. Uh, City of Santa Cruz has the least number of drive alone trips likely due to land use that includes proximity of jobs to housing, high bus use by UCS students, extensive bicycle lane network, and other transportation infrastructures that's in place. The goal of the RTC is basically we want to reduce vehicle miles travel as well as greenhouse gas emissions. Um, Scotts Valley has the greatest number of residents working from home, but also the greatest drive alone trips. So basically, this mode share data shows people's travel preferences are influenced by type of land use and transportation facilities that are available in their community. 
Um, the information, as you said in the RTC study, is valuable for assessing how the number of trips driving alone could be reduced further in each of the cities. Um, I don't think a car dealership is going to reduce any of our traffic. I think it's going to increase it. So I very carefully would ask you to give the 2.5 acre parcel on the corner of 41st and Soquel um, and keep it the same zoning. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome. You don't have to keep the long distance. There's not a, it's not like a vortex right there, I promise. <laughs> no alligators or anything. You can get closer. Good afternoon, welcome. Thank you for waiting. Good afternoon. I'm Pam North from Santa Cruz and I'm here to make a citizen recommendation. No to spot zoning and car-centric thinking and yes to the sustainable plan that you have unanimously adopted in 2014 and stated as well as that it was well done and forward thinking. The citizens don't want this and isn't that who you serve? Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, welcome. Thank you. My name is Susan Cavallari. I'm from Santa Cruz. Um, car travel must be reduced if human life is to continue on Earth. P cars are a pipeline line along our roads, each full of gas, leading to continued exploitation of the land and drilling for fossil fuels. Last week, Bill McKibben spoke at Peace United Church and according to him, we have little time to address climate change. As the planet heats, feedback loops develop, the melting tundra releases methane, ice at the poles melts, and the heat is absorbed from the sun. Housing is a crisis in Santa Cruz County. We need to use imagination, and we need to change the way we are living on this planet. Um, and I would hope that you do not change the zoning. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hi. <clears throat> my name is Ann Steinloff. I live in Soquel, and I'm here to express my opposition to the Nissan development, not only due to the traffic, but rather because it provides so little to the community and myself, unless you happen to own a Nissan. I have a Subaru. So, I don't understand why we're ignoring the sustainable plan everyone spends so much time on. Um, I would urge everyone on the board to vote against this plan and the change in zoning. Please ask Mr. Gropetti to present an alternate plan with a community focus. And then I have a question about the right turn on Porter. Um, <clears throat> there's two lanes that go through Porter. One is a left turn, so if you put a right turn lane in there, that leaves only one lane to go through that huge, that very busy intersection at peak times. So we'll have a right turn, we have a left turn, and only one lane passing through the village. So I think we should address that. Thank you, I've taken down that question. At the end of the public hearing, we'll work to address some of these questions. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Uh, Lisa Sheridan for Sustainable Soquel. Within 1,000 feet of this project, there are over 1,000 residents in four mobile home parks. They were not mentioned in the EIR. Palo Alto Medical plans to expand a number of acres off Soquel Drive. New housing projects are being proposed for the Soquel Corridor. These projects were not mentioned in the EIR or the traffic study. Auto transport trucks, tow trucks, parts trucks, UPS trucks, and other trucks will be arriving to this automotive business. Truck impacts were not mentioned in the EIR or the traffic study. The second paragraph of the sustainable plan states, when housing, employment, and services are closer together, the walkability of an area increases. When needs can be met within the neighborhood, car trips are shorter, and some trips can be made without a car. Without alternative shopping nearby, residents will have no choice but to get in their car and travel. It should not take 45 minutes to drive one or two miles for a loaf of bread or a doctor's appointment. The applicant wants you to think the addition to sidewalks to this project is solving the problem, but any project would have this type of um, addition. 
The applicant wants you to believe him when he says, I will have transport trucks park on my property, but these promises cannot be guaranteed when it comes to the independent trucking industry and the trucking unions and the d driving liability. There may not be a magic bullet to solve our traffic problems, but we must at least make the incremental steps in our thinking and planning. You voted for a sustainable plan which had the full support of the planning department, the CAO's office, the planning commission, and the local SoCal community. Let's see this project through it was how it was intended and not throw out the thousands of hours of good work and the thousands of dollars we have invested in good plan. There is no evidence this plan this proposal to support findings that benefit or outweigh the negatives. Thank Please you, keep the zoning community commercial. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. My name is Larry Lopp. I come from the summit area. So how do we see it? Well, we want you to build a big healthy, prosperous economy down here, because frankly, if you're not prosperous, we're in big trouble. That's the first thing. Uh, during the, the last uh, road closure, about, we were told about 20% of the economy suffered in Soquel due to the lack of our people coming down that road. So we come down here because you have competitive products and services, and if you don't, the people will go over to Silicon Valley. So that's the first thing. The second thing is the traffic on this little section of Soquel we've been talking about has been bad. I've been up there for 42 years. It's never been good. Uh, school in the morning and school in the evening or in the afternoon are times you just don't travel that road. So I would love to see some good synchronized stoplights to clean that, that section of the road up. It would make our travel in and out of the mountains better. And I would point out that Robertson is the absolute best way for us to get to the beach and surfing. So fix that one too. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> My name is Jan Campa, and I've lived in Soquel since 1993. As a result, I heartily support the goals and efforts of sustainable Soquel. So-called primitive cultures had elders who assumed responsibility for tending to the needs of their people and the environment. Future generations depended on their wisdom and foresight. Today, we have wizards equipped with clipboards, calculators, and computers who creatively support developers' proposals in their quest for wealth and empire, automotive empire. Accordingly, our leaders, with an eye on monetary rewards from these developments, work hand in hand with the applicant and county planning department staff for more than a year in crafting EIRs to promote in the community. The assertion that the biggest objection to Nissan's dealership traffic impact can be mitigated by installing an unfunded traffic light is laughable, but not to the wizards. The intersection at 41st Avenue and SoCal Drive is presently gridlocked, and adding a dedicated right turn lane will simply speed up traffic to run into a stalled wall of cars on 41st Avenue, the way they do today. Worse, at the same intersection, forcing dealership destined northbound traffic on 41st Avenue to make a U-turn at Soquel Drive is a recipe for road rage. And lastly, adding more traffic on already congested Highway 1 with no possible mitigation is a clear sign for failure. Our leaders ought to take to heart the maxim of old when making decisions that impact our community. First, do no harm. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you for waiting. Good afternoon. My name is Tara Collier-Young. I live in Soquel and have been there since 1991. I'm curious that the community was not consulted regarding the rezoning from community commercial to business commercial. I find that very problematic. The space clearing that has already been done is not justification for moving forward, and I want to hold that up. I haven't heard that spoken yet. 
I think that sustainable SoCal, as we have worked on it for all these years, must be the first priority and the first lens that we look through as we proceed. And as there is a lot of work that has been made in that space, I would like to ask that the builder consider doing work that is in relationship with sustainable SoCal and that can address a lot of the conditions and concerns that have been brought up in this meeting today. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hello, my name is Dick Shiley. I've been in this area paying taxes since 1972. So I've seen a lot of changes, as most of you have too. I oppose this for several reasons. First of all, if you look at the deluge of numbers from this traffic report, it says it's based, the, high, the traffic data on Highway 1 is based on the figures from 2012. It was in 2013, 14 that the traffic really started gathering steam then, backing up. And if you've been there, you'll see how long it gets during the rush hours. It's miles and miles of backed up cars. So it's wrong data in the traffic report. I'd like to point out that the large delivery trucks that are bringing autos and things will have to go all the way down to Dominican Hospital, travel two miles to get to this dealership. When he turns right on the 41st, he has to cut across the lane, cut off the right-hand lane in order to swing into his dealership. Not a good deal, not, not good planning. The, a dealership like this belongs in the outskirts of town, not in the busiest intersection of the busiest street in the whole county. 41st Avenue is busy. And here we are adding more, uh, an activity brings in more cars to it. That doesn't make sense, it's not good planning. The planning department should know better. I think that if you, end up approving this thing, you are raping SoCal and you're raping the county. Please don't rape us. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hi, I have one page uh, handout to distribute, please. Okay, I'm gonna hand it over here. Can we reset the clock? Yeah. Thank you. Greetings all board members and staff. My name is Anthony Solvera, also representing the North Rodeo Gulch Road Traffic Alliance. I wish to address the conditions of approval, specifically the county staff recommended approval of item 5I, as it relates to no dealer test driving on North Rodeo Gulch Road. We thank the entire planning commission and staff for their support of our regards, of same regards, with their conditions and intentions. Also, thank, uh, I want to thank Nate uh, Macbeth for all of his uh, helpful uh, correspondence. Appreciate that. The concern we have about it is, could the fact that if the Nissan dealer later expands or merges with another automaker, like, for example, Kia or Acura, to also sell and service those vehicles, and if so, is the now identified as Nissan dealership conforming to their conditional use or a possible loophole by not using test drives on North Rodeo Gold's Road only for those Nissan vehicles. But now it feels that they can use North Rodeo Gold's Road for a possible alternative automaker like Kia or Acura vehicles later, not conditioned now. This is precisely what we don't want to happen down the road in time. Please refer to the list I just handed out to all members, please. We have a quick list of auto dealers that can still come in the area that uh, are still available. Mazda, Kia, Jeep, Acura, Chevrolet. Many auto dealers try juggling with other auto brands to see if it works. Just like Ocean Honda used to be Ocean Chevrolet and Ocean Honda. Also, Don Grappetti does have a Honda dealership in Visalia, which shows me that he is certainly willing to consider expanding. So to further implement our goal to maintain the prohibited use by the dealership to North Rodeo Gulch Road from the possibility of going beyond the just Nissan vehicle test drive stated allowance, I ask that you please add this suggested line Thank you. to this text. Thank you. Thank you, and we have it right here. Good afternoon, thank you for waiting. Good afternoon, my name is Liz Levy with Sustainable SoCal. Nissan is a multinational corporation. 
that wants the corner of 41st Avenue and Soquel Drive so that they can compete with a Honda dealership. But the sustainable plan that you accepted in 2014 specifically recommended that this important anchor location have an office park development with pedestrian friendly retail shops on the first floor and nearby mixed use development. People would bike, walk, drive, or take transit to their jobs and get lunch or do useful errands on foot from their offices. It was visualized as a, quote, walkable and inviting urban environment, end quote. No car repair traffic, no transport trucks, no out of region traffic, and no new car test drives. The SoCal community is asking you supervisors to be clear-eyed adults and pres preserve the vision you all signed off on in October 2014 to reimagine this corridor. We know that planning staffers were under a lot of pressure from the applicant to speed up his project at a time when plans for actualizing the sustainable plan were supposed to occur. They bent to his pressure, writing draft and final EIRs tailored to his wants and needs. We think this is wrong. We note that his backers have a petition of a little over 200 signatures, but it only does, has a dozen people from Soquel. I'm submitting petitions with 500 signatures from residents in Soquel and Santa Cruz County rejecting this zoning change. As our representatives, we hope you will honor the wishes of the people who elected you and scrap this terrible program planned dealership. Thank you very much. Thank you. You can hand it over there. Good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon, Chair, Supervisors. Uh, my name is Robert Singleton. I'm the Executive Director of the Santa Cruz County Business Council. I'm here to speak in favor of this project. Um, I'll be quick, just give you a couple reasons. Currently, uh, this, this parcel or series of parcels is an underutilized parcel of underdeveloped businesses and dilapidated buildings. Um, surely the economic benefits we could get out of having some, some uh, tax sales tax revenue as well as a greater use of this building or this parcel would be a benefit over the status quo. Um, the the applicant has bent over backwards in order to mitigate their potential impacts, which I believe are overstated in the traffic impact study, including increasing the length of the right-hand traffic lane, offering additional impact fee monies right here. Um, what's interesting to me is that I think actually if you look at the uh, current commercial uses, whether it be the paint store or the do-it-yourself car wash, the car dealership will actually result in less overall car trips to the parcel. And with the combination of the right-hand turn lane, surely that will actually improve the flow of traffic on the intersection. Um, next, uh, I want to say the opponents in the same breath are saying they support the sustainable Santa Cruz County plan while complaining about the traffic. But any intensive urban mixed-use housing development is surely going to add a lot more traffic than what would be a car dealership with less than 100 car trips to it per day uh, at the high end of estimation. And then consolidating these, par these parcels lastly has inherent economic value for the future. By having a bigger total parcel to work with in the future, it opens up this potential area for a lot of greater uses. Um, in terms of larger housing developments in the future, perhaps when automobiles are no longer the main mode of transportation or other things that might happen. Uh, but certainly having more parcels and more area to work with will be easier down the line to plan for something that the community would like in the future. So thank you. I hope uh, that you will support this project. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome. Is there anybody else who would like to address us after this? Feel Come on, join us. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. My name is Glenn Hanna. I am a 40-year resident of the county. Uh, in 2014, the, the, you, you gentlemen adopted the sustainable plan. In fact, five of the five, four of you are still here, with the exception of uh, Ryan. The, uh, your vote today is going to be a test of your credibility. You promised by your assent to the plan that you had developed at great expense and with much involvement of the community, a plan that you believed by your affirmative vote would serve the community well. We believe that it was true. We participated, we supported you. And now, based on the number of uh, shenanigans that apparently have been going on with relation to uh, paying attention to the plan, you are about to uh, overturn that. 
that will affect your credibility, and for that, I think you might want to pay some attention. Thank you for your time. Good afternoon. Welcome. Thanks for waiting. Good afternoon. I'm Lou Tuosto. I'm a 40-year resident of Santa Cruz County. I'm also a small business owner, and I own commercial property in downtown Soquel Village. I love Soquel. I've coached basketball, baseball, and soccer, and all those kinds of fun things that we do with kids. I'm a former trustee of SoCal Union Elementary School District, sat on the oversight committee. We built three schools, or rebuilt three schools, and a community art center as well. I was on the Carrillo College Citizens Oversight Committee and Corridor Commission that came up with the plan and helped come up with that sustainable plan. I feel that I am a layperson and I give an opinion here, simply an opinion as a layperson. I'm confident that this board has listened and has heard its stakeholders as they have done in past proceedings. I'm confident also that they will continue to take these things into consideration that have come to the board. Not only have we been heard we have been listened to. This has been an emotional project, I realize that. Residential mixed with no door breaking down for people wanting to develop, uh, unfortunately that's one of the things that we run into. Although we have mixed residential zoning, nobody's wanting to do it right now. For various reasons, high cost of construction, bank difficulties, projects uh, are not so good right now because of possible rent controls. 40 years, uh, in the car business my father-in-law was. I know car dealers, to be honest, and they, communi they communicate their needs well, and they also give a lot to the community. I, be I believe that Mr. Grappetti will also do that. This was a blighted area. It is no longer a b blighted area. Ocean Chevrolet, one-third of the size has had virtually no impact on my business, and I believe that whole area as well. I don't believe that this project will hurt us. I believe it will hurt us, help us. I'm confident this board will consider all those that are involved in this, and I hope that you vote Thank according you. to the immediate needs Thank of you, all Mr. the Joseph. stakeholders. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for waiting. Good afternoon. I'm, my name is Austin Comstock, and I represent Richard Novak, who is an owner of a commercial uh, property on uh, the north side of a, a Robertson intersection. Um, the lack of uh, consistent planning on this traffic issue has resulted in the potential for uh, a driveway that is absolutely essential for the operation of one of the businesses, that would be the Crawfords. Uh, uh, John Crawford will suffer if this so-called signalization goes in um, because there is no plan to take care of it. If you have this signal where, where it's, I understand it's proposed, Crawford will have no way to get in or out of his business. Now that's a, that's a, a, a problem that might be addressed by somebody, but nobody has done it so far. And I'm here to talk about the flaw here and the lack of interest in uh, in this i understood that it was communicated by richard novak uh, earlier on but this is an issue that uh, is a serious flaw in the thinking so far and uh, you might give me a contact uh, if you're going to go ahead uh, with this project thank you thank you mr comstock good afternoon welcome good afternoon joe jordan longtime santa cruz resident and elder of sorts, maybe even a wise elder. Speaking of wisdom, uh, there are a whole lot of people around here other than yourselves who are also very intelligent, well-informed, smart, and wise, and they have done, uh, from what I can tell, a lot of really good work on remedying the problem that a couple of people referred to about, okay, that area is sort of blighted and underdeveloped now. Well, the point is that <laughs> there's this whole big plan, a couple of them, maybe three of them if you include the general plan, that say, hey, we could develop this area in a much more enlightened, intelligent, you know, new age, Santa Cruz style way. And okay, so along comes somebody who waves a bunch of money at you and uh, you seem to be willing to just, well, I don't know. I mean, I haven't, I'm kind of late coming on the history of this, but don't, please don't just throw away the benefit of all these folks' wisdom and hard work uh, on, on uh, you know, okay, one idea. And actually,
actually, speaking of which, I mean, there is this unified corridor investment study coming out soon, right? I mean, November, I heard recently, maybe it'll come out sooner. That's all about traffic, including this corridor where this thing is. I haven't heard anybody else mention this, but maybe at the very least, we should wait and see what that study says. I don't know whether they, I don't, I doubt they're including the prospect of this new wrinkle in the, in the whole picture. And if you, my final fallback position, if you are going to decide to do this, then make bloody well sure that they do, or they are required at their own expense to put a lot of solar in there and put lighting in there. There's not going to screw up the already impaired aesthetics and energy use and extreme over lighting of dealerships, car dealerships everywhere and several places around this county. That's an issue that has not been brought up. It's a huge impact on birds, wildlife, and humans. So that's okay. Thanks so much for everything that you do. Bye. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, welcome. Thank you. Um, my name is Karen Gamel. I'm here as an individual. I lived in SoCal for eight years. I currently live in Live Oak. I'm here to tell you that whatever they say about the impacts, you need to quantify. I frequently go back to SoCal at varying times of the day. It can take more than 30 minutes. And until that situation is corrected, I can't imagine why you would even consider uh, a project of this size, as they say, stop digging when you're in over your head. The, the anchor site is the front edge of Soquel, which is beautiful and historical. What you do there is going to be, have impacts for the next hundred years. So rather than thinking about five years or three years, think about 100 years. And as far as five years and three years, how dare you ask the citizens of this county to bear the excruciating traffic that's already there? Please correct the situation. Mr. Gropetti, I'm curious why he didn't purchase a already permitted lot that would have been much more amenable to his business. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address us after this next speaker? Okay, go ahead. Close it. My name is Mary Flodine. Um, I know many of you. I've been here in Santa Cruz since 1976, uh, teacher, homeowner, and a political activist. Um, and many of you, I've worked on your campaigns and voted for you, and I'm utterly shocked and appalled at what you're proposing to do here that I can't believe, I can't imagine why you would even be considering this. This is the 21st century, and as uh, all the they I'd realize that there are many in the business community that have not done their homework and have no idea what we are facing coming into the future. I think some of you have some, some inkling of the climate change issue, issues and consequences coming. Some of you know that there is a huge body of work that has been done and is being done to make Santa Cruz sustainable and resilient as we go forward. A car culture is absolutely unacceptable and inappropriate in this age. This is a 21st century. We are moving away from personal automobiles. We do not want to become another San Jose or another uh, uh, car auto mall attractant. That is not us. Um, the fact that you would consider this makes me think that you're sellouts. I don't know why, what the deal is, but we know that throughout our country from the top White House on, there's lots of, lots of corruption. I would hate to think that that's what's happening here, but I know that there's a lot of money in the car dealership scam. So uh, I would hope that you would reconsider very seriously, stop it, don't even think of it, don't go forward with this auto, auto mall. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to address us? Seeing none, we will now close the public hearing and bring it back to the board for deliberation. There were some questions, I think. Yeah, there was a question. We had one specific question regarding the right, the question regarding the right turn onto Porter. Mr. McBeth, did you have a way you can address that? Yeah, sure. Um, the, there, are, another question. there are two lanes uh, on the eastbound direction, and the right turn pocket will, is basically um, a parking space. It's a loading zone that will be utilized in the peak PM 
as a like do not park here and then folks would be able to make a right turn not a not a, affecting the two eastbound lanes of Soquel. So there's no, they won't be shutting off of an eastbound lane. It would just be creating a pocket. Thank you, Mr. McBeth. So bring it back to the board for uh, consideration. Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I want to thank everyone who came out today to, to speak. The, 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 I've had a lot of conversations with a lot of constituents over the, the, the last year on this project, and so I have a pretty good sense where people stand. Um, one of the things that I've said fairly consistently with this is um, it's, a, it's a difficult Hobbesian choice here because half the people don't want the project because they believe it's going to generate more traffic and half the people want a more intensive development that um, uh, may not be exponentially greater, but it will be greater than, than uh, the proposed project. So you can see that uh, that's being put in a crosshairs of something you can't actually uh, make everyone happy. Um, in thinking about this uh, uh, along the, the way, um, you know, I tried to uh, look first at the Soquel Village plan, a plan created in, in the early 90s to think about Soquel Village. I looked at the, the, the borders of, uh, of what was in the Soquel Village plan. This project is not in it. But I did notice that over the years, we have been able to accomplish much of what was in the Soquel Village plan, with the last major pieces being the creation of the heart of Soquel Park. And when we finish in maybe 18 months, the trail that will connect the village with the Main Street area over by Lions Park, we will have accomplished everything, the, the, the most major pieces of the Soquel Village plan. Um, and I was, it was great to be out there just last week uh, when we started the Soquel Family Movie Night series where we had about 85 people out watching a great movie and I, look, I encourage everyone to come out for that one uh, when we do it again next month. The other thing I took a look at was um, what happened with the Honda dealership because and when I thought about the, the Honda dealership being right across the street, I, I thought, uh, I don't remember this level of anxiety and fear being leveled uh, at, at that time. So I went back and I pulled the uh, information about the Honda plan. That too was uh, zone C2 and it was uh, rezoned to C4 for a dealership that's about twice as large. Um, it, uh, that only had a mitigated negative declaration, although it also had riparian exceptions and it had concerns about birds and that didn't exist on this site. Um, and that was telling to me because the, the, uh, the, the board then was uh, 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 as environmental as this board, as uh, my predecessor was as concerned as the, about the environment and the impacts of SoCal as, as anyone. And so I was trying to understand what had gone on uh, to understand that, to, to, to understand how that got uh, processed. It was done at the, uh, at the end of the term and was built at the beginning of my term. Um, I also started, uh, so I, 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 one thing I've been very clear about with constituents is that there are really two issues, it seems to me, to be here. There's land use choice and there's the impact of traffic. So whatever your choice of what should happen on the corner of 41st Avenue in Soquel, it's going to have an impact on traffic. Now the EIR, right, we did a full EIR that looked at an alternative analysis, but the thing that, they, that became clear is a light at Robertson's, including with synchronization, could have a, a, a good impact on the flow of traffic. And then I thought, well, the flow of traffic is, is good for moving people, but what does that mean for pedestrian and bike safety? And so I talked to uh, 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 traffic engineers, bike experts to try to, to think about that. Uh, the light at Robertson it has been something that hasn't always uh, been uh, something that people wanted in SoCal. Um, but as I say, what, whether you want a mixed-use project or the car dealership, you, there's, a, there's a traffic issue and there's a limited number of tools that we have. So a light at Robertson um, uh, makes sense to me. And then it came down to how do you, how do you pay for a light? The, the, we got information that a light is 
a million dollars when it all said and done, it's a lot of money. Um, but the impact, which we've heard described here today, um, is already extraordinary, regardless of what we put on this site. So getting a light done um, uh, seems to be very important to me. Um, then I try to look at the land use choice. Um, I think about that area a lot. I am through that area a lot. I live less than a mile away. Um, and so I'm through there. My kids went to SoCal Elementary. We, we, we traversed that intersection on a daily basis for 10 years when my kids were at SoCal Elementary. And, uh, and I still go there uh, uh, quite a bit. And I looked around what was there. You know, uh, to me, it seems like a regional shopping area. It, why is it a regional shopping area? Well, look, it has a car dealership across the street. It has uh, a major electronics retailer. It has the Home Depot. It has uh, the Safeway. Um, I looked at the, the, uh, what was around this uh, existing site. It's a car wash, a lumber yard. But I also looked at the other amenities that were around there. You know, there are five restaurants across one of the streets and two more down the street. There are two coffee locations, a juice bar, or a gas station, a nail salon, a tanning salon. You can get your taxes done. You can do your stocks. You can get your fish. Uh, there's a veterinarian for fish. There's a UPS store. Um, there's a toy store. And you can also work out and work on your weight. It's a lot of things you could do. When, when I see my, uh, my constituents from the, um, um, from the summit area, they would kill for half that amount of things uh, in, in their neighborhood. Um, and for the people in the, in the um, mobile home parks that, that have been discussed, that is all accessible to them, mo uh, very accessible to them. And uh, if they walk down the hill, of course, they're in the village of Soquel with the restaurants and shops that are there. So if I look at it as a regional shopping area, it seems like a car dealership uh, fits in there. And this area seems uh, l uh, like it's, it is the commercial area uh, of the county. Um, it, it's where we do most of our commercial activity as the county. Um, and so uh, when I thought about uh, the car dealership, I also realized that in two and a half acres, there are very few things that we could put there in two and a half acres that would generate less traffic than, um, than a car dealership. I mean, I have had people, last night at the supermarket, someone said, well, you could put a park in there. True. Probably would generate more traffic, but, um, but that, that's not a realistic assumption, uh, economic assumption, to put together eight parcels and then have it as a, a very low intensity use. And in fact, someone uh, suggested that we were increasing the intensity. And uh, you know, a C2 use is, um, uh, is actually a much uh, different and you, I could, would say more intensive use than a C4, a service commercial use. Um, I do have concerns about the mitigations necessary to make this happen. And I share the Planning Commission's unanimous concern about the light. I'm glad to hear that Mr. Grappetti is willing to contribute more. But it, obviously it's an expensive uh, uh, infrastructure investment. And so, you know, I, I want to ask the county administrative officer, if we did a light, not only could we afford it, but could we get it done sooner than five years? I mean, I think they, they push very hard, uh, unanimously, to get it done in three. Um, and it seems to me that if we're going to do a project that's going to have an impact, we need to put the mitigation in relatively uh, close to when that impact will, will, will be there. And, and I just got to know that the resources are there to make that happen. Uh, if what we're um, talking about is three years from Occupancy, as I understand, uh, was the, the recommendation from the Planning Commission. Uh, I think that um, that will be challenging, but if the board's direction is that that is uh, what you want us to do, uh, we will find a way to do it. 
Yeah, well, I, I, I think that's really critical because I think that not only helps out people in Soquel, helps people at that intersection, helps people all along Soquel Drive, and, uh, including in Aptos, the people, you know, we know, uh, uh, Joe brought up the Unified Corridor Study. Um, we, are, we are looking at our three main transportation corridors through this county. Uh, Soquel Drive is one of those tra transportation corridors. So is the highway, so is the rail corridor. We're gonna have a lot of discussion about that later on in the year. I don't think we need to wait uh, to make deci any decisions about, uh, uh, about, um, uh, about what gets developed there, because uh, the level of detail that the Unified Quarter Study, they won't come down to figuring out what light needs to be on what intersection. Um, it's really looking about how we can increase efficiencies uh, uh, of the whole system. Um, I'm also concerned about uh, uh, bicyclists uh, uh, as part of this. Um, I've had some long talks with Yannicka Strauss from Bike Santa Cruz County about the infrastructure necessary to be able to make that safe uh, for um, uh, uh, bicyclists. And uh, if we move forward, I would want staff to work with Bike Santa Cruz County to come up with reasonable plans uh, to ensure bicycle safety is, because that's a main transportation corridor um, uh, 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 for the county for bicyclists. And, you know, we added the first green lanes in the entire county in Soquel uh, because we wanted to make it safer there. And so as we think about the changes in traffic there, we want to ensure that the safety um, uh, for bicyclists is maintained um, uh, throughout. This is a difficult choice. Um, but it's, I look at it as, as balanced between the needs of uh, the community more broadly, um, that uh, I think it, it doesn't mean that we have thrown away the sustainable Santa Cruz County plan, uh, because as I look at the Soquel Drive corridor in the first district, um, when I look through North Rodeo Gulch, through um, uh, th to the hospital uh, heading west, there's at least 10 acres of undeveloped land. Um, there's, there's many more acres of underutilized land. And that's where the residences are. Um, uh, that's where the school is, that, you know, that's where, the, that's where the greatest walkability is for that part of the community. And I look forward to the, to the conclusion of the uh, environmental review process for the, for the uh, uh, sustainable Santa Cruz County plan uh, because I think it'll allow us to, uh, to enact those pieces um, at an uh, appropriate location. Um, uh, I don't know whether we're ready for uh, a motion, Chair, whether you want to uh, hear from others. I, I will say that, that, um, that the, I guess the last thing I'll say is some of the, some of the folks who have, uh, have wanted me not to be supportive of this uh, project have asserted that this project would be better off someplace else. They generally point to Watsonville, as if Watsonville should take the projects that no one else wants. Um, uh, but as I look here, there's a dealership across the street and there are dealerships in Capitola less than a mile away. Uh, this seems like a reasonable place, uh, an appropriate place uh, to make the, uh, this kind of investment and to allow this kind of activity going on and I support the project. I have a couple conditions that I would add on to it. Well, if you'd like to make a motion, I think it'd be appropriate we can continue discussion when, if there's a second. Yeah, well, so uh, one question that I would ask, uh, uh, Mr. Silvera uh, asked, he was worried about the language about the test drive um, on North Rodeo Gulch. And I think the, the, the language, I'm not sure if he's still here, the, uh, the, 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 the question comes, uh, he, he was worried that if the dealership changes, if Nissan becomes something else, um, it does it. Yeah, yeah. No, I think, the, it was, so his question is around the word dealership. Right. And do, do we need to have some other language there that means that whatever uses that are there, that the test drives don't happen on North Rodeo Gulch? Because I appreciate, and I've talked to Mr. Silvera, and I've talked to the Honda dealer, um, about the restrictions they have. They, they actually have in their employee manual that they're not supposed to do test drive, that their employee training is, is, uh, is supposed to, it tells people not to, not to test the cars there. 
Um, and I want to make sure that we have the strongest language possible uh, to ensure that people don't drive on North Rodeo Gulch. And I guess I'm looking for either uh, council or, or our planning staff, is, is there, it, does this cover any car dealership or does it, does, do we need to strengthen the language? Do we need to say no um, exceptions for all uses? <clears throat> Nate or Kathy may wish yeah. to speak this as well, but the condition in general would apply to the use, so the, it would carry along with the permit. So any use under this permit would be subject to the conditions. Um, I, I, we could add something that's more specific if it would make you more comfortable with the it, approval. Nate, do you, I don't know whether you wanted to weigh in or, or sure. the, uh, Mr. Silvera has included some a, a language, and I don't know whether we need to include that or not. Yeah, um, well, based on the way that the, the condition currently reads, that's I of, I don't have an actual page number, but I can read that into the record if you'd like. Yeah. I feel like the, the, the conditions will live on with the, with, the, with the development. So if the dealership changes at any point, <clears throat> they'd be subject to these same conditions. And the conditions don't specify Nissan, it's just dealership. So if they, they you know, we're selling a used vehicle, it was a Mazda or something, they would still be subject to the same condition not being able to use uh, rodeo, North, North, North Rodeo Gulch for test drives. Yeah, I mean, if, if we put by anyone employed or associated with the dealership or the property is mm -hmm. prohibited, then yeah. that covers any time anybody wants to use the property. Right. R whether it's a Kia dealership, Chevrolet, right. or an, any of the other uh, concerns. I don't think there's any harm in adding those those three words, you know, the dealership. Yeah. So I would or the suggest property. that 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 we uh, <coughs> that is part of my motion. Um, uh, I'll try to capture it all. Okay. So um, you know, there's the adopt the mitigation monitoring and reporting program and statement of overriding consideration and certify the final EIR in accordance with the requirements of CEQA. Uh, adopt the attest resolution, which was in the the recommended actions. I won't go through all the APN numbers, uh, if that's okay. Um, sure. Adopt the attached ordinance about rezoning the APNs. Uh, uh, direct staff to complete the installation of the traffic light and associated right-of-way improvements at Robertson Street and SoCal Drive within three year of building permit issue. Um, direct staff to return at the first meeting in September with a uh, with a, a low-cost, over-the-counter encroachment permit process to require any business wanting to unload products or material within the county right away to obtain a permit. Um, direct staff to work with Bike Santa Cruz County to review the bike lane safety treatments at the intersection of Soquel Drive and 41st Avenue, Robertson Street and Porter Street to ensure bike safety is adequately addressed at these locations and return to the board uh, prior to the building permit issues for these right-of-way improvements for review. Um, approve the commercial uh, development permit application 171179 and the associated sign exception and roadway and roadside uh, exception based on the finding and condition. And lastly, um, change the language in this subsection I to say test drive shall be limited to arterial roads and highways, use of North Rodeo Gulch Road for test drive by anyone employed by or associated with the dealership or the property is prohibited. And I think that, that, that captures my motion. Okay, so you have a motion for the recommended actions with those, those changes or additions. Yes. Is there a second? I want a second. All right, so we have a second from Supervisor Coonerty. Uh, Supervisor Caput. Question. Uh, <coughs> When we get a lot of projects, what we didn't even consider here is, what is the minimum size of the lot that this dealership would uh, would accept? If it was, uh, what if it was only 2.1 acres instead of 2.6? Uh, would that would that be a big enough lot for the uh, Nissan developer to come in and do? And then the other question is, how big is the uh, the Honda dealership across the uh, the street? Does anybody know that? The Honda dealership is over four acres. That's correct. It's it's uh, twice as big. Yes. All correct. right. So I, what I'm getting at is, why can't could we do something where uh, 
a half an acre is set aside for like open space, maybe a park or whatever, and then 2.1 acres is the uh, uh, is the actual dealership, and whether or not it doesn't it, the magic number doesn't have to be a half acre, but is that a negotiable part of the uh, deal or it's all or nothing? It's not part of my motion because that's not what the project's before us, just to, to, to redesignate a portion for open space. Uh, you know, Anna Jean Cummings Park, which has both open space and recreational area, yeah. is, uh, is relatively close to here. We have another park in Soquel, the farm park, which we're actually trying to construct after many years of conversation. The heart of Soquel Park, which we just completed relatively recently, we're still trying to finish phase two and phase three. Uh, as part of it. We also uh, got some uh, emails from a uh, constituent uh, who, from the car business who their charge was that two and a half acres was too small for a dealership. Um, uh, so I, I, that's a level of engineering that I, that right. I, I I'm not, uh, I like the idea of open space, but this is the commercial area yeah. um, and uh, you know, the, the, the uh, uh, I don't feel confident that I could determine what would be a right amount, wrong amount. Uh, I'm trying to deal with the, the, the proposal that's in front of us. Okay, then I'll get back a little bit just on aesthetics part. I, like I said, it doesn't have to say uh, a half acre smaller, but something where parking lots and car dealerships look, look very similar. We're talking about a number of cars and they're constantly parked there. It's like uh, shopping, uh, window shopping. Uh, you know, how many cars do you have to have in order to be able to have a, you know, uh, a well running business? So, something to brighten it up aesthetically in that area where maybe we were talking about a quarter acre then. Well, uh, uh, the, 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 the owner could uh, tell you about what his needs are, but I will just say that I've tried to take a look at the number of trees. And sure. I, I heard Mr. Grappetti express his unhappiness with the number of trees um, yeah. because he wants to show off his cars, right? That would make sense. That's what you do at a car dealer. But, uh, you know, we've, we've conditioned at the Honda dealership to have trees to soften the look of the dealership. and. 50 trees on this site is, is it's a generous amount of trees. Um, and I think it'll look, it, it can look very nice. Um, uh, I'm not exactly sure uh, uh, what your goal is uh, other than aesthetics, because on a, a small property that, uh, that's open space in the middle of a commercial area, you know, it's on one side is bordered by a car wash and the other side is bordered by uh, uh, a lumber yard, so it's, yes. you know, I, I'm not sure that, yeah, that that's what, a place I, where we would go recreate. Uh, all, all of them could be improved to make it look aesthetically better, I guess. Well, uh, as the, they get redeveloped, the, the, you can, but you can't, you can't just throw something on something. I, I'm, the, the owner can speak about whether he can deal with a smaller dealership or not or, and speak to that issue. I, it's not for me to say. I don't know, it's a new way of looking at it. Uh, to me, if you had a space, uh, I, I purchased a car before and you're standing out there uh, surrounded by a lot of cars. If they had like a little small area that has uh, shade and trees, you could sit out there while you're waiting to think out whether or not to buy a car. But uh, anyway. Uh, Maybe you wanna say. Uh, what, what you have to say is, is very important because it's in your area, so. Yeah, as I say, I would love your support, uh, uh, Supervisor Caput, so we can complete the farm park and the Heart of Soquel Park, because, you know, there's, the, uh, the farm park was a permitted park that we lost the money after redevelopment, and it had great amenities that included a bridge, a community center, um, community gardens, and we've only been able to build a portion of it because we haven't had the resources. So um, um, I'm working very hard. Uh, the CAO will tell you that, uh, that when we meet, it's a regular topic of, of conversation to find more money um, uh, for our, our existing parks, because I have these projects that aren't done. And uh, it, it's, it's hard. And let's just uh, try and stick 
to the public hearing topics to the best we can, um, which you were, you were able to do it. But I mean, uh, so Supervisor Cabot, just um, what's before us specifically are the things that we should be discussing about in the public hearing. Okay, so no, nobody would accept changing an amendment, making uh, a quarter acre of it uh, uh, like a reception type uh, green area that's part of the uh, project. Mr. Grappetti, do you or is one of your representatives want to just talk about the, 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 the tree plan, what's going to happen in the reception, or something to, to help inform uh, the conversation? I mean, it might even make your business even more successful. I don't know. The, the, the guide for, for a dealership uh, our size is actually close to three and a half acres. Um, while we have 129 parking spots, uh, when we take employment into, into consideration, customers into consideration, we're going to have fewer than, than 30 day supply of cars on the ground as it is. And typical dealership will have anywhere from 60 to 90 days worth of cars on the ground. Uh, so uh, to, to, to reduce that, to reduce that um, count from 80 to, to 60 uh, would, would make the project uh, really, really difficult. Uh, what about from 80 to 70? <laughs> so I'm, I, I'm, I'm just trying to get a little bit of... You know, I, I, I know that it wasn't mentioned here, but I, you know, I, what, one of the concerns I would have about that, uh, you know, I, is, is, is potentially the, the uh, uh, at one of our, either our public meeting or at the Planning Commission, I'm not sure which one, there was some comments about the, the, the homeless uh, people uh, that work that corner. Um, uh, to me, uh, uh, I, I, it's just not a place for a, uh, if I had, if I had five or six acres and you were asking me to give up a half an acre of land for a park in the middle of it, I think it makes an awful lot of sense. But at two and a half acres and the way this, the way this parcel is laid out, uh, I, I, I don't know how, I don't know how you make it work. I just, I don't. Do you have a specific amendment to offer then? Well, I'm, I'll offer it. Uh, uh, I'll make it as small as I can, I guess. Uh, something, uh, uh, a quarter acre would be uh, part of the, uh, the, that it would be a green area. Uh, maybe, uh, I don't know how to, uh, how to phrase it. It would be a open space green area, or it could be a reception area too, meaning that it's got some uh, trees and it's got some grass maybe and, you know, whatever. So a I would, uh, that's what I'm offering, uh, a quarter acre instead of a half an acre. So we have a proposed amendment to convert a quarter acre of it toward open space. Um, is there a second to the amendment? Um, no, just care. I can make the assumption it's not a friendly amendment for the maker, correct? It, it's, it's not a friendly amendment. So, I, I, no, I don't support I don't the amendment. And, and I believe that there, the, the, I don't know whether there's park dedication fees as part of this. No. I think those are only charged on residential yeah, development. Okay. But okay. Uh, just as a point of information, I'll, uh, the project complies with the code requirement of one tree for every five parking spaces. I mean, it's a net addition of trees that are on that current site. I yes. mean, it's pretty significant. It's a it's a blighted site. So we have we do have a motion and a second. There was no uh, second there to the no amendment. Second. Okay. Was there anything else additional, Supervisor? I, I did, that's about it. I, I just thought if somebody was thinking of buying a car and they saw squirrels going up a tree or something, it might make them more apt to buy a buy a car. <laughs> so anyway, I don't know if Mr. Grappetti is going to hire you to sell cars for him under that construct, <laughs> but um, it's something that we can <laughs> we can all consider. Right. Okay, that's all <laughs> we right. have a. We have a motion and a second, sir. Uh, Supervisor Coonerty? Sure. Yeah, I just want to real briefly. First of all, I appreciate everyone coming out. And, uh, and I, you know, I think there's lots of, there's lots of opportunity to disagree about this project. And I think my planning commissioner mentioned, you know, sort of like, this isn't the most exciting thing that you get involved with the land use planning is to have a car dealership. But I will say, jobs and a tax base are a value um, and it means a lot to the people in the community who have those jobs or the people who we serve with our services when we have an adequate tax base. Um, I do think that when you uh, look at the alternative uses, uh, as we've seen with similar sized 
properties in this area, as I think was mentioned, we're talking about, as an alternative to get to the real mixed use, we're talking about probably over 100 units, three stories, uh, with some mixed use built in there. That would be, um, uh, it would be a, it could be a net benefit for the community. Uh, it would have a tremendous traffic impact, and it would have a very difficult water impact uh, that we've watched other projects struggle with. So if I thought that 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 was the choice that was likely to be before us, um, I would be making, i uh, probably have a different vote uh, than supporting the project like I am today. Um, but I don't think that right now um, the economics would make a project like that work. I think there would be significant opposition um, and uh, which would only raise the cost of a project to make one of those make a project like that more difficult. Um, and so given the, given the proposal to us, given the nature of the area, and given um, some of the public benefits, I think uh, I'm supportive of this project today. And I guess I, but, but one other thing is uh, there was a mention of uh, climate change. Uh, Supervisor Friend and I are on the Air Resources Board. We're giving out um, uh, rebates for electric vehicles, and we're the first air district, I believe, in the state, maybe even in the country, to give out rebates to for used electric vehicles. And the Nissan Leaf is easily the most affordable uh, electric vehicle, uh, especially used for low income people. And so to the extent that we're trying to reduce carbon footprints and giving people options uh, that we'll, we'll be expanding as we expand Monterey Bay community power uh, and expanding you know, electric charging stations and other things, this uh, particular dealership could have a real uh, benefit to people who are trying to come up with an economical uh, and environmental choice of their for their cars, and so I think that's also a, a potential benefit for this community as we as we try to subsidize and really grow the electric vehicle market to to, to reduce our carbon footprint and and help low income people reduce some of their fuel costs as well. Thank you. We have a. Motion and a second, any additional conversation? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, I'll cast a no vote. It's a 4-1 vote. No, I, I voted yes. Yeah, yeah, I voted no. I know it's surprising well. that you, <laughs> uh, I know it's normally 4-1 the other way, but as a 4-1 vote uh, on this thing, uh, Supervisor Friend will vote no, that's me. Um, that's the end of this meeting. Our next meeting is on June 12th. I'd like to thank Community TV and the Sentinel for covering.